All right, scum and villainy, let's make some noise for Kevin Smith and Mark Bernardin, Fat Man Beyond! <laughs> Welcome to Fat Man Beyond. I'm Kevin Smith. I'm Mark Bernardo. Hey! <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Great to be back. Sold out show here at Scum and Villainy Cantina in Hollywood on Hollywood Boulevard. Put your hands together so the folks at home know you're real. A very happy Juneteenth to everybody. Um, <laughs> that was almost scary. Yes. Like that little beat before. It like, was a beat where people were like, I don't want to get it. No, they, they jumped on board. Uh, I have to apologize. It wasn't until I got out of the car that I realized I'm really not dressed appropriately for Juneteenth. <laughs> Tell them what you told me in the alleyway. <laughs> like Colonel Sanders showed up for Juneteenth. <laughs> Who got these sugar spices? <laughs> Thank God I didn't wear the white hat. <laughs> That's true. Good point. Good point. I did almost die. Yeah. Um, I mean, as long as there's no, like, clan hood in your fucking <laughs> closet. <laughs> Truly. Like Don Johnson. Truly, man. Uh, hey, Wap, before we dive into things, uh, be like Linus in the fucking Peanuts Christmas special where they put a light on him and he has to explain the meaning of Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> and explain Juneteenth for those folks at home who are like, do what? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, boys and girls, as we <laughs> gather around the uh, whatever anti-slavery fire we have here, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Juneteenth is a, is a celebration of the day where the residents of Galveston, Texas learned that slavery had been abolished. Ooh, there's... What was, what was that? Galveston chiming in. I know. <laughs> Over to Galveston, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Live from Galveston. Now, because, you know, the Emancipation Proclamation allegedly freed the slaves, uh, but it turns out that nobody told them. And so it took the Union Army to eventually make its way throughout what was the country at that point, and the last place they made it to was Galveston. Um, so it took two years to tell everybody, by the way, you don't have to go to work anymore. Um, and so that is the reason why we now celebrate. It was June 19th, 1865. So that's why it's Juneteenth. That's why we celebrate. It is not just a black holiday, it's an American holiday because, you it's know. It's a federal holiday it's now. It's a right? federal holiday. <laughs> so uh, my, my, to my white friends, you can now come to the barbecue today. <laughs> Tomorrow's another story, but today is fine. Just don't bring potato salad with raisins in it. No. Or oh, hell no. Um, um, and thank you for the Wakanda Forever. Themed appropriate. See, I'm not fucking around. Um, all right. Um, it is also, we're just coming off of Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to you. Happy Father's Day to you. Happy Father's Day to all the... Happy Father's Day to all you motherfuckers out there. What did you do for Father's Day? Uh, I watched movies in my house without my children. <laughs> what every dad wants. Oh. Can you take the reasons for Father's Day away from me for a couple of hours? <laughs> uh, but no, it was lovely. Like my, my kids made me breakfast in bed in the morning. Fucking tradition. Then I didn't do anything all day. I watched movies. I watched Time After Time. What was the last time you saw Time After Time? The, the, uh, the Malcolm McDowell, the David I'm Warner. The uh, Jack yeah, the Ripper. H.G. Wells, Wells v. Jack the Ripper. Probably within the last 10 years. Yeah? Yeah. The movie really fucking it holds fucking up. It fucking holds up, right? Yeah. It was actually like one of my first time travel movies that, that explained the concept to me as a kid. But I was like, oh, that's fucking, that's wild. Yeah, that's how that works. And I felt yeah. very on brand for a, for a stretch where I was going to be talking about The Flash. Um, so I'd watch a good time travel movie. And there's a preview of Mark's opinion of The Flash, everybody. Uh, Can I tell you my favorite the part of The Flash a weekend? Because I watched it. Uh, f let me see. I saw it at the premiere on Monday, so a week ago from today. Then we had screenings at Smog Castle Cinema's Watch with Kev, so I watched it three nights 
uh, in a row. So guess how I feel about it. Um, <laughs> but my favorite moment uh, outside of the movie itself, movie proper, was I watched it with uh, Harley, my daughter, on uh, Thursday. Yes, it was adorable. She was in Jersey shooting an indie film, and so I picked her up. She came down to Smog Castle with Austin, uh, blockchain Coltrane from Kirk Clerks 3, her boyfriend. And so we're sitting there watching, and I've already seen it at the premiere. Mm. And so I'm sitting there watching it with her. And about halfway through the movie, uh, she's talking about the two Ezra Millers on screen. And my actress daughter whispers to me, do you think they got paid twice? <laughs> <laughs> and if I had a pause button in the theater, <laughs> I would have paused it and been like, who raised you, man? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I went to, aside from that, uh, I went to the city on, uh, God, was yesterday Father's Day? It was. Yeah, so yesterday I, went, I was in New York City. I was just in, on the East Coast, and I was in New York City, and we went to see the new production of uh, Sweeney Todd at the Lunt Fontaine with uh, Josh Groban and Anna Lee Ashford, I think her name is, playing Mrs. Lovett, who is hands down the best Mrs. Lovett I've ever seen. I never saw Angela Lansbury do it in 1979. I was too young. But I've seen five different mountings of Sweeney Todd, which sounds exactly as filthy as, as I meant it. And she was fucking incredible. It's always a darkly humorous show, like gallows humor, but it's actually, they turned it into a, a flat out comedy. And, and the second half is still a tragedy, but it was absolutely fucking wonderful, man. It was packed and shit. And we had like second row seats. I could see up Josh Groban's nose. And you got those famous people seats. No, I just overpaid for them. <laughs> Anybody can do that. You ain't got to be famous. You just have to fucking be stupid. Um, but it was well worth it. It was a really good time. And then uh, I got on a plane this morning uh, to come out here. I was going to go see my mom, but I'll go see her next week. Uh, it, the boys told me last week that the show, this, this show was sold out. I was like, oh, we can just stream it. And they were like, we fucking sold tickets, idiot. And it sold out. <laughs> and so I was like, all right, here I come. So Fine. we're back, yeah. <laughs> Happy to be here, everybody. Glad to be in Los Angeles. You gave me a reason to come home and fuck my wife. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm wearing this kingpin-like jacket. <laughs> Like the green jacket at the Masters, <laughs> like here's what I get every time. <laughs> white as the cum that shot from my dick. <laughs> Speaking of which, we got a sponsor to read about, <laughs> and that sponsor is indeed Blue Chew, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's episode of Fat Man Beyond is uh, sponsored by a couple people, but first up, the good folks. At Blue Chew, man, how well does Blue Chew work? You can get a month for free, so you might as well try it, man. You're going to like it, and so will your partner. Nice. You like that delivery? Oh. Oh, I that wonder was... if I get paid twice for that. <laughs> that, was, that was velvety smooth. It was. And look at me. Trust me, I'm clearly a guy who knows what he's talking about. Uh, this episode is sponsored by Blue Chew. Let's talk about sex, guys and girls. Remember the days when you were always ready to go? Well, now you can increase your performance and get that extra confidence in bed. Listen up! BlueChew.com. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra? Yeah. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. uh, but oh, I know. I was going to say, but gonna, <laughs> with authority, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's the one. That works for me but in chewable tablets and at a fraction of the cost. Tell them more, Mark. You can take them anytime, day or night. You can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Eat them in a, with a fox. Eat them in a box. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> the process is simple. Sign up at BlueChew.com. Consult with one of their licensed medical providers. And once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. The best part, it's all done online. So no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, and no waiting in line at the pharmacy. BlueChew's tablets are made in the USA and prepared and shipped direct to your door in a discreet package that now everybody will know what it is because we just told them. <laughs> yeah. Don't wait by the post for it and shit. Your neighbors will figure it out. Like, he's waiting for yeah. his fucking dick medicine, isn't he? <laughs> oh, you got my stiffy pills? <laughs> uh, you, could be, uh, miss, you could be missing out on the best sex of your life, kids. With Blue Chew, men everywhere 
are excited to see the postman. Just like you said. Yeah, truly, man. Because when your package has arrived, your package has arrived. Thank you. They always say first impressions are important. What about lasting impressions? They say there's nothing sexier than confidence, and Blue Chew can help you give that confidence where it counts. Your In your dick. dick. Yes. <laughs> Blue Chew wants to help you have better sex. Discover your options at bluechew.com. Chew it and do it, man. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Uh, try Blue Chew free when you use the promo code FATMAN at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com, promo code FATMAN to receive your first month free. Take that last line. How well did Blue Chew work? You get a month for free, motherfuckers. You might as well try it. You're going to like it, so will your partner. So visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring us. I love you. <laughs> Give it up for the good folks at Blue Chew. Blue Chew works fast. How fast? Barry Allen fast, kids. <laughs> to keep it on topic. Uh, shall we dive in? Let's fucking do it. I saw The Flash uh, four times. Now, let me throw out a, a series of disclaimers because the internet is just fucking having at it with, with me. You know, I'm not allowed to like things. No. And the moment I do, people are like, you're a fucking idiot. I'm like, all right, fair enough. Uh, here, uh, let me say this. Uh, the issues that people have brought up time and time again to me, when I say I like a thing, they try to knock you off your fucking high horse of enjoying a thing. One of the reasons people tell me I should not be liking this movie is based on the CGI. Yes. That seems to be something a lot of people have been attacking online. Here's my feeling on CGI. People are like, it doesn't look realistic. I gave up on realism the moment I bought a ticket for a movie about a guy who solves all of his problems by running fucking fast. <laughs> I cannot make CGI myself. Mm. So I never hold anyone to a higher standard of something I can't fucking do myself. I know a lot of people think that's some sort of cop-out, but I did direct that, so... <laughs> it makes fucking sense. Um, yes, some of the CGI looked a little rubbery or whatever. That never once took me out of the movie. That sort of thing doesn't take me out of the movie at all. Uh, you're dealing with things that aren't really there to begin with. So uh, chances are, as long as you can get the impression across to me, I'm never going to be one of those people who's like, looks fake. At the end of the day, I don't give a fuck how real CG kind of works or it looks. It's still fake in my head. I know it's fake. Like, even if it's like, wow, that looks convincing, it's like, but it's fake because fucking shit like that doesn't happen in the real world. So that didn't pull me out. I saw a lot of people being like, the babies didn't look real. I was like... So you wanted real-looking babies in Jeopardy <laughs> falling off buildings, you cruel fucks? Yeah. By the way, spoilers. Yeah, oh my God. Uh, has everybody seen The Flash? <laughs> Who hasn't seen The Flash? What the fuck you? is wrong with you now? Uh, you weren't alone, I assure you, man. I saw the box office It's your grosses. fault, guys, why there's going to be a Flash too? It's you and you guys. Yeah. Um, let's see. What did I think? I, I look... I uh, didn't go to see The Flash as much as I went to see Batman Returns again, <laughs> co-starring The Flash. Uh, and in that way, I was completely and utterly satisfied. I, I, it's no secret that I was there for Michael Keaton Batman. Michael Keaton Batman was like one of those seminal moments in my movie-going life. Uh, June 23rd, 1989 one of the happiest days of my movie-going existence. Uh, June 26, 1999, one of the happiest days of my real life, that's when my kid was born. Mm. But June 23rd, 1989, as a moviegoer, oh my God. I mean, fucking, you gotta remember, we weren't spoiled like everyone is now, where they have a comic book movie comes out every fucking week. They just dropped a trailer for Craven the fucking Hunter, for God's sakes. <laughs> But when me and Mark were kids, they didn't have that sort of thing. We had a Batman, uh, two Batman growing up. We had the, yeah. Just, the Super Friends Batman, mm -hmm. and we had Adam West. And so when uh, 1989 Tim Burton's Batman came out, my review of that movie was like, oh my God, finally, the most realistic Batman that's ever happened. <laughs> Which now has been a dated comment and whatnot. So between that and three years later, Batman Returns coming out, and admittedly, I'm more of a Batman fan than I am Batman Returns. I know a bunch of people on the internet are now chewing me a new asshole, but I like the first one just a little bit more. Um, 
I, I was so excited for this movie. The moment they announced Michael Keaton was involved, I was like, that's fucking fantastic. And I base everything on what I like, right? So I was like, this movie's gonna make two billion dollars, man. Cause who the fuck doesn't want to see Michael Keaton put the fucking suit back on and shit? Apparently a lot of people don't give a fuck about <laughs> yeah. seeing You've got it. very specific feelings about June 23rd, 1989. Very much so, yeah. Others, not so much. There's an entire generation that could give a fuck less about Michael Keaton being Batman because he was never that Batman. That's the nice thing about this Batman concept. Everybody gets one. You know, like fucking uh, our parents or like Ralph Garman, who's a little older than me, my Hollywood Babylon co-host. His Batman will forever be Adam West. Uh, my Batman will forever be uh, Michael Keaton. Uh, for some people, it's Christian Bale. For others, it's, it's Batfleck, um, who's also a bit of mine as well, but like, I've, I've, I've seen him naked, so that shouldn't count and shit. Um, then there are people that are like, Rob Pattinson, go fucking figure. So everybody, <laughs> and don't forget, there are largely a bunch of us who will always think of Kevin Conroy mm -hmm. as the king of all Batman. So, Everyone gets the Batman they deserve, and I really deserve the Michael Keaton Batman and loved that Michael Keaton Batman so damn much. Was alive for the hype when that movie came out. Before the movie came out, when they announced Michael Keaton was cast, there was no internet in 1988, 89, and still that news broke the fucking internet. Because people were like, ew, Mr. Mom, Mr. Beetlejuice is gonna be Batman. And for a year, you had to hear that shit. In the mainstream press and in comic book stores, people bitching about Michael Keaton. I believed in him, man, because I'm a big fan of Michael Keaton, period, as an actor. And he had just come off of Clean and Sober, where he gave a, a dramatic performance. Most people know him from his comedy stuff. But Clean and Sober showed that he could do darkness. He could do something real. So all that fucking uh, hate for Michael Keaton as Batman went away when the New York Post published what I think is the first photo of Michael Keaton in the Bat costume, wearing in the Bat suit, next to the Batmobile. And then suddenly that piece went everywhere in the world and everyone started shutting up. And you remember how seriously that, that release was treated. Like Times Square had the Bat symbol for like one year straight hanging up. People were getting the fucking Bat symbol carved into their hair and shit. There were people who didn't fucking know anything about Batman who jumped on the Batman train. And I'm not one of those like fucking uh, garage band fans where it's like, I liked it when it was cool. The more the fucking merrier, man. The more people liked Batman in 1989, that was not a bad thing for me. That was a good thing for me. I never liked being alone, liking a thing that you could only explain to a few people. More people jumped on, that was great. And also, more people jump on, they can ask you all sorts of questions that you can answer for them. Like during the pandemic, I watched every Marvel movie with my wife, and part of the fun was just watching a Marvel movie with somebody who'd never seen it before. The other part was when she was like, I don't get it, and I could pause it and be like, well, let me tell you the story. <laughs> I'll tell you the movie story, the comic book story, and the fucking what the internet says. And we do it in half an hour on that and start the movie again and shit. So I was never one of those people that was like less, I, I like more. I like when more people come in. For example, when it, we talked about it, when across the Spider-Verse, I, I, I saw that at, at my movie theater, at Smock Castle Cinemas. As I was sitting there watching it, I was thunderstruck by the notion that here's a movie that goes so deep, not just on the multiversal concept, but on fucking Spider-Man that like it's mainstream, it's making all this fucking money. It's not making money from just people who read the comic books. Uh, your mother, your father, your grandparents can appreciate that fucking movie. They have trained us for the last 10 years, the entire audience, the mainstream audience, to be as nerdy as fuck, as nerdy as some of us were back in the day. And to quote or to paraphrase um, Syndrome from fucking The Incredibles, when all of us are nerds, then no one will be. And it's nice. I think that's a cool thing that everyone could get in on the party. The only problem is people get real tribal about this shit. Hardcore yeah. tribal. Nobody could just enjoy a thing. Everyone's got to dissect it. Everyone's got to throw in their opinion and tell you. And I don't care about people throwing their opinion. It's when people want to take your opinion away from you or make it less or tell you you're wrong for feeling the way you feel about a fucking piece of entertainment, for God's sakes. I loved this Flash movie. I thought it was real fucking fun, man. I had a good ass time. So much so that I watched it four times. Here, I'm gonna admit to something I probably shouldn't admit to as a filmmaker, and maybe fucking Warner Brothers takes away my right to show the movie in my movie theater. I sat there and I taped fucking 10 minutes of that movie. I shot it on my phone, the entire Batman and Russia sequence. I was like, I'm gonna jerk off to this. And I shot it, 
from the back of the theater on my phone. Nobody was there. I said, run it. And I just fucking shot it. I bootlegged the fuck out of it. I'll never put it online, but I'll be honest with you, I have watched it nine times since then. A nice 10 minute clip. I watched it on the fucking plane when I was flying home. Person next to me was like, is that on video already? Yeah, like, why can we day. never show trailers on this show? I don't know, maybe <laughs> because one dude pirates shit and then tells everybody. It made me so fucking happy. It was like getting the Batman 3 with Michael Keaton that we never fucking got. And no disrespect to Batman Forever with Val Kilmer, which we'll be talking about in a little while. No disrespect to, to the George Clooney Batman. No disrespect to any fucking Batman movie. I, I would have loved to have seen a third Michael Keaton Batman movie, and we kind of got it with this. Um, if you are a DC fan, I'm not saying that you have to be a DC fan to appreciate this movie, but if you've been a long time, DC, long suffering DC fan, <laughs> it was joyous, man. I felt it was kind of like a Donner-esque dive into DC's glorious past. Um, nerdy as fuck, it, you know, the multiverse is now something that Marvel's done multiple times, and this feels like uh, DC's first live action step into it, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. We've seen them do it, of course, in the animated movies. They did the Flashpoint as an animated movie. Um, and the whole time, I, I, was, I was enjoying the fuck out of myself. The opening sequence with the Justice League, or w what they gathered of the Justice League, was a good-ass time. It took me two viewings to be like, holy shit, they're doing Batman in broad daylight. Something that they never fucking do. And then I was like, holy shit, he's wearing the blue and gray suit. Something that we've always wanted to fucking see. Holy shit, he's talking to the fucking Flash. Holy shit, spoilers, Wonder Woman shows up. Holy shit, like, there's cohesion here. Um, now, you know, I'm not saying, like, holy shit, it was better than, than anything Zack Snyder did. They, Zack Snyder laid the fucking track for us to see these characters and whatnot. And it was a bittersweet goodbye to an entire universe the guy built when, you know, Barry's having a conversation with Bruce Wayne and, he's, and he nerds out a little bit where he's like, we're friends, you wanna like hang out? And he goes, maybe not, not this time, maybe another time. And you know what's about to happen. I thought Ben sold it really fucking well. I've seen Ben as Batfleck again was joyous. Um, not only as Batfleck, but as Bruce Wayne. He said in, in a few interviews, he was like, look man, I just figured out how to play this character and that character, and now it's all coming to an end. It's kind of bittersweet. But he got that bite at the apple before it was all done, because he said many times he's never going to go back to Batman. You know, there's a multiverse, so we'll see if that fucking happens. You know, I could see a world where 10 years from now, after he's lived a, a bunch of other life and done other things, that if someone, because I know Ben loves The Dark Knight Returns in a big, bad way. Most of us do, but like fucking all through Chasing Amy, he read that on the floor of my condo. He slept on the couch and shit. And he was always like, why can't somebody do this as a fucking movie? And, you know, when Zach did BVS, he got damn close. He got to wear the outfit and shit. There were elements of Dark Knight Returns. So I can't imagine if somebody backed up a money truck 10 years from now and said to a fucking nearly 60-year-old Ben Affleck, do you want to do The Dark Knight Returns? He might say yeah, and that would be glorious. But for right now, he had to put the, the cowl away, and he seems to have had a good time doing it. Uh, I know a lot of people online like went after him as a, a smiley Batman, because at one point uh, he smiles, God forbid, and shit. And people were like, what the fuck? It, it wasn't bad. I thought it was a cute little joke with the lasso of truth. They've done the joke before, mm -hmm. but I liked what they did there. If you listen very fucking closely, man, because I've watched it four fucking times, when Batman, Batfleck is holding the, the Wonder Woman's uh, lasso of truth, he can't help, well, at first he's like, I, I, I can't say thank you because of my large ego that I've built, you know, to deal with childhood trauma and shit. And then she says, this is the lasso of truth. And he, you hear him say, he throws the line away, but I, I thought it was hysterical. He goes, I don't know why I'm trying to get rid of crime. I should get rid of poverty. I have all this money. <laughs> <laughs> it's really fucking fun, shit like that. I think, what was her name? Christina Hodson? Hodson, yeah. Wrote the screenplay. She wrote... Uh, Bumblebee. Did she write Bumblebee as well yeah. as, as uh, the other movie, uh, Birds of Birds Prey? Birds of Prey. Um, I thought the screenplay was fun. I was shocked at how much humor they went for in this. I'd heard from people, they're like, oh, it's a funny movie. But they actually did lean into the comedy of it all. I heard a lot of people talk about, like, it takes a lot of cues from, from Back to the Future. I mean, it flat, flat out did Back to the Future jokes 
they leaned into it so much. Definitely more lighthearted than Jeff John's original Flashpoint uh, take on the sub same subject matter. They kind of, you know, took a one layer of Flashpoint and then did their own fucking thing with it. Um, I thought the Justice League opening was good time. One of the f finest comic book action sequences I've ever seen in a movie. The entire opening sequence. Him rescuing all the babies and whatnot was good fucking time. I, I thought, I, I couldn't believe they let him get away with like scalpels fucking racing at children's faces, acid and shit. He stuck a baby in a microwave, man. And the audience fucking cheered like it was nuts. Um, so that was lovely. And then, you know, his, his whole like why he goes back in time uh, it was strong enough. You know, not, it was certainly they could have gone deeper. It was basically Iris gives him the idea. And he's like, oh my God, you're right. And then decides to go fucking back in time. Uh, a lot of people online have attacked cr the chrono ball, uh, which is what he's running in when he winds up in the looks like a theater in the round of, mm -hmm. of the multiverse. You know, I'm like, that's a choice. It didn't bum me out. I wasn't like, fucking, oh, I would have done it differently. I honestly would never do any of this shit differently. I don't have that kind of imagination. But in terms of like having to present a multiverse, it was a choice. They went with it. I didn't bump into it at all. Um, they showed a lot of people that looked very CG. I think that was because they weren't going to get everyone live action, so they were like, let's establish a look and go with it. Which, you know, for a person that's grown up reading comic books, it's like, oh, there's, people make choices, and artists make choices, and the choice they made, I didn't bump into. I got what they were going for. I was never fucking visually lost. Like, what the fuck is going on? So I didn't bump into that at all. Um, him going back in time to, sit, again, spoilers, save his mom, you know, I, I'm not saying you got to be a robot not to fucking like fall for that concept, but if you got a dead parent, man, that shit works. That's why Batman works so well on me and shit. My dad's dead. My mom was like, yeah, but you liked Batman when dad was alive, too. <laughs> I was like, I know. I was always wondering what, 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 what could have become of me had you both been killed in an alleyway. <laughs> so that, you know, Jeff Johns created that aspect to the backstory of Barry Allen. Barry Allen, when I was a kid, didn't have like, my mom was killed and shit. That was added years, years later. But, you know, uh, it's... It's a concept that fucking works, and they used it well uh, in this movie. Um, him getting knocked into the, his, I guess his 18th year, once he goes back and saves his mom by putting a can of tomatoes in the shopping cart, um, he then gets to see his mom go through all his years and, and memories that he didn't fucking have and shit, and then on around his 18th birthday, some dark flash knocks him into the fucking present time. And that's where most of the movie tends to take place. That's where uh, Ezra runs into the other Ezra. And you know, if, if you didn't like Ezra Miller, having two of them must have been really fucking hard for you. Cause suddenly you got twice the fucking Ezra, better than Ezra, twice the Ezra and shit. Um, yeah, there's lots and lots of that. Um, the, uh, and uh, I thought that stuff was effective. Uh, I laughed. I thought there was a good sense of humor to it. Um, and then, finally, they did the thing that I paid the money to see, which was they went to Wayne Manor, and they fucking brought Michael Keaton back. First as Bruce Wayne, as old, haggard, fucking bearded, hippie Bruce Wayne, who apparently likes to paint, <laughs> which I thought was really cute. And then um, he has no interest in helping him. He gives a very eloquent explanation of the multiverse using spaghetti. And then uh, the, uh, the berries go into the bat cave, and, and they're like, well, he says, like, well, if he won't help us, we'll use his bat shit. And the other guy's like, what? Which is a good fucking joke. It's a good line, saying bat shit. Um, something I would have done. I was jealous. So once they're down in that bat cave, oh, my God, it all begins. Even before they got there. They, the way they lovingly recreated the fucking room in 1989's Batman where, you know, Alexander Knox is like, he was king of the wicker people and shit. The way they lovingly recreated the fucking kitchen where Alfred tells a story about young Bruce and shit like that in 1989's Batman. Like, it was crazy. They would spend such a short time in these giant fucking sets. Like, if it were me, I would have set the whole movie in that one fucking room because I'm like, you know how much it costs to rebuild this shit? But that's what they do in movies. They fucking spend, and boy, did they spend on this movie. They said 200 million bucks. It's kind of the part of the problem with the whole thing. Is like, 
when you spend that much money, then you got to make so much money back. And boy, they spent a lot. But this is a movie that's been in production in one way or another for the better part of nine to ten years um, with its you know, series of problems that it was fraught with. So once uh, uh, they lower the fucking bat wing and once you see Michael Keaton in the suit and he does the line which he's been doing in the trailers and shit where he's like, yeah, I'm Batman. Uh, we were off to the races for me, man. Michael Keaton played it exactly like he played it in 89 and 92. Like a, a, a solo act who doesn't really relate well to others. Um, the... The, the fun callbacks to, you know, the 1989's Batman. Um, even something as simple as, like, him fucking going, how much do you weigh? Like, before he fucking, he's trying to launch, like, this elevator with the two berries and uh, a very skeletal Supergirl, and he puts an explosive under it, and then he's timing it out or, on, or measuring it out on his wrist gauntlet and shit. And he grabs this thing, which looks like a detonator, and then he opens it, and it's like measuring tape. And he's measuring to, like, he's doing simple fucking math. I thought that was, like, so sweet, man. It echoed back to my Batman exactly, where he was like, well, I devised this shit for a certain weight. And I don't know how much you fuckers weigh, you know. He, he did it to Vicky Vale, and fucking, like, 30 years later, he was doing it to fucking The Flash. Um, putting him uh, in, in a fucking bat, I mean, letting him fucking fight in a way that he never got to fight before. And yeah, like I know that wasn't Michael Keaton fucking whipping and beating ass. What? Oh my God. But didn't he look like the fighting version of Michael Keaton from 1990? All did. the moves were very similar, just very rapid and much stronger. And he never, he kept on. Always doing this shit. <laughs> totally, somebody grabbed him from behind, he backed into a fucking wall and shit. He used his batarang in an expert fashion. He used the fucking thing real good. I don't know what you call that, obviously. Um, it's that thing. That thing. Mm. Everything about that sequence, him going to Russia. I thought it was fucking badass and true to character when they get into the fucking giant ball that they're holding Kara uh, Car Zor-El. And he sees this on Superman. He's like, it's not him. Let's go. <laughs> and he's willing to fucking abandon her there and shit. I was like, that's my Batman. He don't give a fuck. Uh, so I loved all that shit. I loved his sequences as Bruce Wayne where he would sit there and talk to Barry and talk about like, you know, I, went, I, I, used to, I, I would put on a cape and fight crime as if that could bring my parents back. Like all that shit rang so fucking true uh, to my favorite version of Batman. So my love of Michael Keaton Batman definitely fueled uh, my enjoyment of this movie. But that being said, if they hadn't gone with him, I still think I would have really enjoyed the flick. I thought it was put together so well. I know a lot of people online bumped into the third act. There were uh, what I feel like were homages to characters from the past, which featured some actors who weren't with us anymore. I, I don't know the logistics of that. I cannot imagine that Warner Brothers, a, a, you know, a publicly traded corporation, is going to use anyone's likeness without getting permission from somebody's estate. Can't imagine they'd risk it. That being said, if somebody's estate is like, have at it, I don't see why it was an insult. Some people were just like, how insulting to use the image of Christopher Reeve. The theater I was in, all four fucking times when they showed Christopher Reeve, everyone went fucking nuts. Nobody was sitting there going, boo, this is disrespectful. Every, every, disrespectful. Everybody felt, oh man, there's my Superman, or there's a Superman that I grew up And then Helen Slater like, flies up next to him and shit. I was delighted to see Adam West. Um, you know, George Reeves is not my Superman. I know he has a tragic past in real life and whatnot. Um, but I can't imagine they use George Reeves' Superman without getting some form of permission from his estate. You, I, you would have to. Just because you own a movie doesn't mean you own the likeness rights. I know this for a fact because in Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back, we had Jay wearing a shirt that featured the character of Olaf on the shirt from Clerks. And I assume since the studio owned Clerks, we could use that image. And we couldn't, and we got sued, and we had to pay somebody off because of that. So if that was the case with fucking Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back, I can't imagine Warner Brothers like, let's do whatever the fuck we want. They had to get permission, and I didn't bump into those appearances. Like, I thought it was a nod to their cinematic past, their multimedia past. 
Uh, I thought it was weird that they didn't show the guy who played Flash for nine fucking years, man. Especially when Ezra showed up on the Flash. And especially because I, I've heard, I don't know, I can't fact check it, I didn't speak to Grant Gustin, but I think they shot a cameo with him and they just didn't use it for time or whatever the choice was. Um, but no, I didn't bump into that hard enough to be like, pick up your coats, we're leaving, you know. <laughs> just seemed like an odd choice to show the Jay Garrick Flash. And according to the internet, nobody knows who that Jay Garrick Flash was. I thought it was John Wesley Shipp, but I've heard no. In fact, I believe you just told yeah. me no. You thought it was the guy who was in The Flash who played Jay Garrick but turned out to be Zoom, spoilers, for fucking six years ago. <laughs> um, but he's, uh, Teddy, he's online going, wasn't me. So does anybody know who was the Jay Garrick Flash? I thought it was John Wesley Shipp. It looked fucking just like, what is it? Of John Wesley Shipp? I mean, it could have been pulled from the show and not a re... Because clearly Has John Wesley Ship gone out? Uh, Bamf man, jump in here real quick. <laughs> what? Bamf. Hey, look, it's Bamf man, everybody. Uh, Bamf man, if I was home, of course, I'd be all over uh, the comments and shit like that. You got a laptop in front of you. Can you find out if John Wesley, John Wesley Ship said anything that it was him? To me, it looked like him, but it's a very quick, pun intended, flash of the character, so I don't know if I'm right. But we know it wasn't Teddy, because he's out there saying that it's not him. It's, it's a hard thing to Google, because you Google John Wesley Ship Flash and Jay Garrett, and you, you get a thousand results. Well, why don't you add from... in the Flash movie, motherfucker, and that will help your search. Because it's, it's <laughs> you need oh, to provide no, you that didn't. as much information as possible. No, you didn't. Oh. It's still, like, fucking burn all the TV. <laughs> It's all the TV stuff. Well, it's somebody fucking smarter than us will figure this out. Yeah. Um, seeing Holy Adam shit. West even for a second was cool. And to address the fucking giant spider in the room, yes. I was dumbstruck and delighted to see uh, fucking Nick Cage fighting a giant spider in the third act, man. In the third act. Um, I, a lot of people ask me, like, did you, what the fuck did you know? I, I knew because Russ Burlingame at comicbook.com had reached out to me a couple weeks back, like when my mom first got sick and I was in Florida and shit like that. And, um, you know, I was feeling kind of in the dumps because at one point they were like, you got to get hospice care for her, which is never a good fucking sign. So uh, Russ was like, I could really cheer you up, man. He's gone, but in order to do that, I have to spoil a piece of the flash for you. And I don't really care about that kind of thing. So I was like, go ahead, spoil it. And he was like, uh, Nick Cage shows up as Superman and fights a giant spider. And I was like, get the fuck out of here. And I can't say this for a fact, but my mom got better after hearing that news. <laughs> <laughs> so a shaft of light beamed in. Do with that what you will. Um, I, it was, uh, I was like delighted. When that moment happened at the premiere, I was sitting next to Jennifer, my wife, and I, like, when it fucking popped up on screen, I turned to Jen and I was like, that's my Superman. <laughs> and Jennifer, who has been with me for 25 years, was like, yeah, I know. <laughs> she goes, I've heard the fucking story and shit. Uh, I got a second bite of the apple when I watched it with my kid, who I was like, well, she don't fucking know. So when that came up on screen, I turned to her and I was like, that's my Superman. She goes, Dad, everyone knows that. <laughs> You've been talking about it for years. Yes, for a guy who told that story over and over again, to see it show up uh, was delightful, man. As I've told many uh, outlets, Rolling Stone, comicbook.com, a bunch of people have asked for a comment on it. I'll say the same thing here. I have spent the better part of 30 years of my career uh, given shout outs to pop culture and I've now lived long enough and my career has lasted long enough where pop culture is starting to shout back and that is really fucking nice uh, that, that, yes. that being said I don't feel that was just a shout out to me that's a shout out to Tim Burton that's a shout out to Nick Cage a lot of people have been involved in this ill-fated Superman and a lot of people um, like, can lay claim to it not the least of which is John Peters now, fucking, if all weekend long, everybody's been blowing me up in my texts and on Twitter going like, what the fuck, your mind must have been blown. If you think my mind was blown, <laughs> I wish to God I could have been next to John Peters when he saw this, because I'm sure that motherfucker was like, I knew it would have worked. 
Because it looked fucking cool, man. Like for the 12, 15 seconds, whatever it was, I was convinced. I was like, fuck, they should make that movie now, man. Nick Cage looked badass and shit. And in a world of multiverses where we've got like 86 different Batmen, why can't we have a fucking Nick Cage Superman movie, man? Throw somebody fucking 75 million bucks and be like, do with it what you can. Fucking do the Mandy version. Give it to Panos Cosmatos and do like, do the Mandy version of fucking Superman Lives. Why not? I guess probably after Flash, no chance. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> when we get into the third act, one thing I thought was uh, kind of effective, they did a bad job at hiding that uh, young Barry would eventually be the villain. That was the one thing I thought was strange the whole movie is, yes, Zod is there, but really the movie doesn't have a villain so much. You know, Zod is a threat, but it's not like fucking Barry. Barry's fighting grief. It seems to be the big enemy. That's the driving factor that sends him back in time and whatnot. Um, finally, in the third act, other than Zod, they give us the true villain, the Barry, that young Barry is the one that knocks old Barry, or older Barry, uh, into, into 10 years ago, where we spend most of the story and whatnot. And I liked that. I thought it was kind of dope, the way he was just like, young Barry was like, no, he wouldn't accept the deaths. And he was like, again. It's like, shows a real video game mentality. An entire generation raised on like, we'll just hit restart and fucking go, which is something you can't do in the real world. And I thought it was kind of bittersweet that they went with that in the movie as well, where older Barry at one point goes, this world dies today, like no matter what we do. And fucking younger Barry wouldn't accept it and has apparently spent fucking time immemorial trying to go back and fucking write it and write it and write it and couldn't do it the entire time. I thought that was kind of dope. Watching, uh, I thought Supergirl was wonderful, but my God, like I was shocked when they, spoilers, deep spoilers, killed her off and then killed her off and then kept fucking killing her off and shit. I was like, there goes that franchise. Um, but uh, I kind of got what they were going for, man. And then uh, the, the, the really bittersweet uh, piece was watching my Batman die. He came back and then I had to watch him die twice. My only complaint is I wish they would let him die a third time because I I'll watch Michael Keaton go out heroically as many times as they want. If they wanted to do two hours of Michael Keaton Batman dying <laughs> and saying something bittersweet each time, I would have been there for it and shit. I thought it was really a wonderful. Well, you can make that cut for yourself thanks to your... It's on my fucking phone. Just fucking loop it. I didn't, I didn't shoot that part. I shot him kicking ass and shit. I think I you've got him. opportunities. I will. I'm going to go back and shoot the whole thing and cut my version of the movie. I'm Barry Allen now. I'm going to right the wrongs of the past. Um, it was, uh, uh, you know, watching him fly to Batwing into the fucking plane where he couldn't get out and shit and he kind of flies into it in the kamikaze style was, was, you know, like, yeah, that seems like a Batman thing to do. I thought it was badass as fuck, though, where he's fighting the space giant. He just keeps putting bombs on him, and finally his fucking head blows up. And that's when he's fucking, you know, falls to the ground and shit. And then uh, Flash is, you know, holding him and talking to him. And he's like, you know, he says, I, I can't bring you back, can you? Can I? And he's like, you already did, kid. Like, oh, come on, man. You've got to be a fucking robot not to be touched by that and shit. Fuck! <laughs> I loved it. I loved that moment and stuff. Um, when Barry has to face the inevitability of like, all of this was my fault by a fucking, his Tony Stark moment that he created all this by making a choice uh, and, and sticking a can of tomatoes in a, in a cart. I liked that scene. I thought it was strong when he went back and saw his mom. Somebody asked me in one of the Q&As I did at Smog Castle, like, do you think his mom knew it was him? And I was like, I don't think that's what they were playing for in the movie. I said, but it'd be hard not to know it's him. He takes, she takes his fucking glasses off at one point, looks exactly like her son. But you know, she just was like being kind to a stranger and shit like that. I thought that scene was effective, you know, it made me glass up. And then, um, you know, him, young Barry, kind of sacrificing himself, which is what kills old, old, old Barry, made sense. Um, and then Barry running back, through time, fixing things, coming back to a present where it's not, you know, the PS to the whole fucking movie is, uh, is a, the joke button is uh, a Batman gets out of the car. And uh, Ernie, Smog Castle keeper Ernie O'Donnell is my partner in Smog Castle, um, along with Ashley and Jeff Swan. They went to see it at CinemaCon. Uh, well, I was supposed to go with them, but that's when my mom got sick and stuff, so I couldn't go. 
Ernie said that was the moment the movie ended. As soon as the door opened and a foot came out of the car, they cut it. And he was like, I think they were trying to surprise it, keep the surprise hidden. I think there's a world where they hadn't shot that until like fucking two weeks ago. Like it feels like they were like, it could be anybody. And I'm sure they were asking Christian Bale for like months and months, hoping that he'd break down and he was like, no. So they're like, all right, let's pivot. <laughs> let, let's do another Batman. And they just grabbed George Clooney, which was kind of fun and, and funny and, and, uh, and cute and stuff like that. So I watched the movie four fucking times, enjoyed it four fucking times. Um, Yes. Uh, Visual reference. Um, And I'll watch it again a couple more times. Um, I, you know, I'm a comic book movie fan. I'm not discerning, kids. If you ever want to hear an intelligent take on this shit or a fucking, you know, critical take on this shit, I I hope by now you understand that it's never going to come from me. (laughs) It will generally come from the man to my left. It'll never be me! It'll never be me! No, I I like it too much. I grew up in an era without all this shit. And to have a movie like this, you know, uh, and then of course online a bunch of people uh, are like, well, Ezra's problematic. And, and, you know, I I thought I was going to have to be asked that question when I went to the premiere. But Warner Brothers made it a red carpet where it was just photos only and nobody with a microphone and shit. But if somebody had asked me, I would have said, look, I went crazy recently and I went to a mental health facility and not once did I ever see Ezra Miller comment on it, so I'm not going to comment on (laughs) Ezra Miller's mental health issues and whatnot. Uh, You know, there are people that make these movies and some of them aren't like golden shining paragons of virtue and whatnot. So I kind of left that at the door and, and, you know, I'm sorry if that makes me a bad person and stuff, but I went in to watch the movie and I watched the movie many, many times. Um, I enjoyed it, man. I, 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 I'm not going to raise something up uh, at j- or lower something to raise something up, but I, I enjoyed it more than some comic book movies I've seen more recently. Um, you know, I, I, I hoped that it would do a bunch of fucking money. I don't have skin in the game. I'm not one of those people that's like, I, I root for a movie to make money, or even worse, I root for a movie not to make money. There were a bunch of people online who were like rooting for this movie to fail actively. Like, I hope it flops and shit. I was hoping that it did better than it did, or at least great, because Michael Uslan's kid said that Michael Uslan, Michael Uslan, Benjamin Melnicker, the two guys whose names have been on every Batman movie and uh, animated film uh, because uh, Michael Uslan went and got the rights from Warner Brothers years and years ago. I'm sure most people have seen him on Batman extras and whatnot. Wonderful guy, lives in Jersey. But I saw his kid at the premiere and his kid was just like, I said, where's your dad? He goes, he's home watching the grosses. And I said, why? And he goes, because if this movie does as well as the Batman and the Batman, Matt Reeves, the Batman opened at $130 million. So he goes, if this movie opens as well as the Batman, one of the next Batman movies they're going to make is Batman Beyond with Michael Keaton. So I was like, oh my God. Now I hope the movie makes a lot of money. Based on last weekend, we're never going to see that Batman Beyond movie with Michael Keaton. So it's kind of a damn shame. Now, you know, don't don't weep for Andy Machete. They've announced that he's going to make the next Batman movie, which is The Brave and the Bold. So clearly, you know, they think that he's a talent. I think he is too. I thought the movie was enjoyable as fuck. Um, so I'm, 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 I was there for The Flash, man, four fucking times, and I'll be there a couple more times as well. Uh, it was a good time. Here we go. <laughs> Oh, man. I love a blood sport, you guys. This is great. Take her down, Mark. Yeah. Take her down. Here, here's what I will say. Okay. I love Michael Keaton. I thought he was great. I loved Sasha Kale. Or Kaye. I'm not sure you pronounce her last name. Who played Supergirl. She's amazing. Like, every scene she's in, she holds it down. Um, I, once you get to the Michael Keaton shows up and it becomes a superhero movie, I'm like, all right, this is fun enough. I love the fact that Michael Shannon's like, what are we doing? Great. Zod again? Fine. I don't really want to be here, but you're paying me, so I'll fucking put this shit on again, and I'm going to shit on it every chance I get. 
He did. He did kind of talk about it where he was like, well, look, in Man of Steel, I got to dive into a character. He's like, here, they told me where to stand and, and told me what to say. And he said it was more like being an action figure. So he was mm -hmm. like being played with as an action figure, which I kind of get. Michael Shannon is a legit fucking actor, one of the greatest actors of his generation and, and stuff. And this movie, while it was fun to see him in the suit, didn't really allow him to act as much as he, you know, is his gifted to do so. Indeed. Um, so much of this movie rides on two things. It rides on your being gobsmacked by slow motion, supposing to be fast motion, and twice the Ezra Miller you thought you were going to get. I don't have a ton of patience for either, only because I've seen the former quite a bit, and I'm not as enchanted by Ezra Miller as some people might be. Um, for various reasons, and it seems the audience is not that enchanted with them either. Um, <laughs> I don't he know. just got that. <laughs> um, but here, here was my problem with it. Like, too much of the movie is Back to the Future with way too much of the shittiest McFly. Namely, it's Back to the Future 2. <laughs> And it's the like, that's fucking low, man. It's the hapless, oh gosh, Dad, I'm home. What are we having for dinner, old pizza? Bah, I don't want it. It's that for an hour. And that's a bit too much of that for me. Um, and, and while I'm here for a guy who just wants to, to see his mom again, I didn't understand how his mom being alive, a lovely white lady from suburbs, suddenly means that Superman is dead. Like, I couldn't connect those dots. Not only that Superman is dead, but he was dead before his mother would have been killed. Right? Like, that's the chronology. Like, by the time he saves his mom, he's eight, right? He's a younger person than fucking Superman is. Yeah. Or 12, however old he's supposed to be. Clark Kent would have already landed on Earth. Oh, my God, you're right. And so... And... <laughs> It's, no, but then you can't. Oh, it's the spaghetti excuse. It's always what you're what you're just, missing what at home, she? kids. Front camera, please. What you're missing at home is you can be Latino and white, you know. What, what, okay, welcome Spain. Would you like to talk to Spain? They're all white people in Spain. <laughs> FYI, they're stop, European. Stop. There's a the whole internet. Hey, happy Juneteenth, <laughs> you guys. That doesn't know what's going on. Anyway. The yes. audience argument was, uh, the spaghetti argument is what negates what Mark just said. Yeah, except, again, it's one, quote unquote, white lady in the suburbs who is somehow involved with her death with interstellar events. Like, that is not a butterfly effect that I can fucking buy. Buy spaghetti. So. She was Spanish? Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, Mark, she was Spanish. That explains everything. <laughs> that explains everything. <laughs> Look, I'll buy that. I'll take that. So, like, I just, once, once the movie stopped being about Barry and his mom, because it does stop being about Barry and his mom, it becomes, oh, Zod is going to destroy the planet. Then I'm less interested in it because I was here for the story of a kid who wants to have his mom back. Uh, or a kid who maybe wants to find out who kills his mom, which he doesn't seem at all concerned with yes. at all. Yes. Like, should I stop the guy who's murdering my mom? Nah, I'm about this tomato life, yo. So I gotta put this fucking can on, I gotta make sure she's got it in the cart so she still dies, but maybe a little later though. But I could stop it from ever happening. Nah. Should, should I find out who it is? Nah. I, I didn't bump into that, <laughs> <laughs> but you're absolutely right. Like, like cause there's, there, here's, why, here's why I know logically they didn't touch it, because Andy Machete said in the sequel it was all going to be the reverse Flash. So that's why they didn't address it in this movie, but what did you say out in the, in the alleyway beforehand? I don't remember. It was, uh, <laughs> I said that to Mark. I was like, well, Andy Machete said that that's what they were going to do in the sequel. Oh, yeah. and, don't set the table for tomorrow when you're cooking a meal today. Yeah. <laughs> like... You may never get to tomorrow, so make the movie that answers these questions. Like, at the very least, tell me why he doesn't care. 
because he doesn't at all. And his magic solution for this is, I'm going to put these fucking cans up on the top shelf just so my dad can suddenly, like, his face can be on the, on the screen. I can spring him from jail. As opposed to, hey, coppers, here's the guy who killed my mom. I guess that would have made a lot more sense. But that's okay. We're all about restocking shelves. So... <laughs> um, Boy, so how like, did they get that far without somebody pointing that out? I mean, apparently there's 98 versions of this movie, and maybe it had been something that had been there before, and they went a different way, and all these movies have these sort of vestigial limbs that maybe get sutured and maybe don't. Maybe that was one of them. I'm not sure. But it just felt as if, you know, a dude who works in, like, literally the police fucking crime investigative unit is never like, I wonder who that was who, like, shanked my mom. I don't Good know. Point. I never thought of that. You know, and so like that's when it decides it needs to have Supergirl. When it decides it needs to have, I don't even mind Batman because Batman is a fucking detective. Should be the guy to say, hey, Barry, who killed your mom? <laughs> Maybe we should do that. Wouldn't that be great if we figure out who, who that is? But they needed to have an end of the world. They needed to have some giant pulse. Wait, you're saying Batman should have asked that question? Yeah. Don't attack Michael Keaton Batman. <laughs> He's fucking infallible. He's like the Pope. He's the Pope. I'm not sure how infallible the Pope is. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, listen, I, I didn't hate this movie at all. Well, that but, put that on a poster. I mean, that is, that is my standard, like, I didn't hate this movie. Two thumbs kind of to the side. <laughs> <laughs> Meh, says Mark Bernard. <laughs> yeah. It's a little mid. Um, but it just, it, it, emotionally, it didn't really hold together because it kept taking its eye off the ball, which is, here's a guy who just wants to save his mom. And when they engage with that, it's, it's actually very touching. And that scene at the very end where he gets the last moment with his mom and gets to hug her, like, it's adorable and wonderful. And it rolls a tear because of course it does. But I, I didn't care about Zod. You know, I didn't, I didn't care about that whole thing. I didn't care about living in apparently that fucking ship, the world engine is to the DC universe what the blip was to Marvel, which is like, guys, I've kind of had about enough of this. Is there another story we can tell that is not about this? And it seems as if that answer is not quite, um, or at least not yet. I'm hoping that James Gunn and his vast array of movies that he wants to make is, is less concerned with a world engine and Zod than this movie was. Um, and I'm, I always have troubles with a movie where it wants to be static. The goal of this movie is to return to the status quo, which is actually kind of... It's very much Wizard of Oz like that, and as much as like Dorothy starts in a place, goes on a magical adventure, and ends in the same fucking place. And this movie was the same thing. Like Somebody asked me at the Q&A at Smodcast over, over the weekend, they're like, how does this affect the DC Universe going forward? I was like... Not really at all. Kind of doesn't. And how does it affect Barry Allen going forward? Not much. Do you think he's now trapped in a pocket universe, though? Sure. The spaghettiverse, <laughs> where where everything is possible in, in this little bowl. And it's like I can have all these Batman. Like, okay. And why are there different Batman and not different Flashes? Like it's always the weird multiverse thing where it's like, listen, you guys, we want to have like a bunch of different Spider Men. But also, we went to multiverses, and it's the same Doctor Strange in all these multiverses. So why is that? How, why are these rules so odd and different? Like, there's 19 Batman, but there's never the same Batman? Bam. Yeah. Hey, Bam Bam's here. Give it up for Bam Bam. He'll tell us what to do. Just because we've been lucky to have 19 different Batman that we can put in a movie, but Benedict Cumberbatch is the only Doctor Strange. It's like a real-world problem. Except you could 100% cast a bunch of pale British dudes to also be Doctor Strange. Like, that's cheap. Like, BBC's got them on speed dial, so... So, like, I don't know. And I kept on wondering why there's no Linda Carter. Yeah. You know, like, if you're gonna show me the parade of various people in various universes, Fucking Linda Carter, yo. That's true. You know, where's Michelle Pfeiffer? Like, where's, where's, like, that Michael Keaton Batman did not have a story of his own. His story is entirely Barry's story, except for when he says, I had to lose my parents because his parents got to die, I guess. And, like, but what does he want? What's his regret? 
and you fucking got Michelle Pfeiffer, who's still alive and still acting and still hot as fuck. Like, give me a scene with Selena Kyle and Bruce Wayne where he regrets fucking that up because he was an asshole. Like, do the thing. Do the job, guys. So listen, hey, if you love this movie, I'm so glad you love this movie. If you like this movie, hooray for you. Um, it made $55 million this opening weekend, which is worse than Black Adam. Yeah, that was really bad. They were, they were original estimates a month, uh, two months ago, it was going to open $140 million. Then they readjusted last month or when it went up on tracking to say, like, it's not going to do that much. You know, we're hoping to get to 90 or something. And then that number kept coming down. Even on Sunday night, they were saying, or Saturday and Sunday, they were projecting um, 60 with another 10 on Juneteenth. Correct. Which a lot of people were like, why do you suddenly think it's going to make 10 million on Juneteenth? It's not because like of all the black people in the movie. <laughs> One. Kind of. <laughs> like, Iris West is barely a character in this movie. I even forgot she was in the movie. And somebody was like, no, no, no I freaking Kirstie Clemens is there. I was like, oh, that's right. Um, so he was never making like $10 million. No, and so now it's as of today, they talked about like, what did it do? 50? Uh, it did 55 for the three days and then I think another six or 61. So that's definitely less than Black Adam, definitely less than. Um, well, Black Adam was their bar because they were going like, it's got to do better than Black Adam because Black Adam was considered a, a tank. Yeah. And so if it doesn't, then, my God, what is this considered? I haven't seen anyone call it a flat-out flop, but they are saying it's a huge disappointment. It is. And, you know, I, nobody's really sure why. You know, there's a lot of Monday morning quarterbacking. There's a lot of second-guessing. There's a lot of, you know, was it the fact that you didn't have a star who was going to do press? Or even if you had a star that could do press, which, like, they were wise not to, uh, to do that. Um, because of the Writers Guild strike, there were no late night shows either. There's no late night shows, and, like, nobody knows how much magazine covers or online stories put butts in seats. It's unclear. It's unclear how much the audience just didn't want to fuck with Ezra Miller. Um, yes. that, that story... It's a big part of it. That story, his story, their saw. stories... Excuse me. I have to remember, I'm a 51-year-old person who's still getting used to things. Yeah. Their stories have been public and have been proliferating through the Internet for a good long while. People know who they are. They know what they did. And so whether those things get exonerated, whether he's indemnified, whether he's whatever those things, whether they are getting the help that they need in going through treatment and will emerge a different person and a better person, all of that is on the table, but the public perception is maybe not this guy slash person. Still getting there. Um, and so I don't know. Those are all open questions. Um, it is entirely possible that the $50 million they hoped they were going to make extra on top of this for The Flash could have been spent reshooting The Flash with a different person. Um, I'm just saying. It was always there, you guys. <laughs> it was always an option you had. We if found you wanted. out why they didn't, because they'd shot not just one movie with Ezra Miller, but two Ezra Miller movies, essentially, because Ezra played two parts. Mm. Got so paid twice, even. <laughs> yeah, he got paid twice, according to my kid. Um, so, listen, that's that. If, again, if you dug the flash, I'm happy for you. I'm always happy if you dig a movie. It didn't work for me on a couple of different levels, some of which were just emotional, some of which were... The plot didn't quite crank out for me the way I hoped it would. Um, nostalgia only ever goes but so far. Um, Not I, for me, man. <laughs> nostalgia, that's all you need. You don't even need a plot or good acting <laughs> or good CG. If it's just a pure fucking shot of nostalgia to my heart, man, I'm like, oh, this is the best. <laughs> but again, I'm not known for my discerning taste and shit. I did make yoga hosers. Can I have this shit? Banff. Hey, Banff uh, man, welcome back. Uh, so there's uh, rolling back to who played the Jay Garrett Flash. Yes. Who answers? There are uh, a lot of people think it's Teddy Sears. Teddy Sears but it's has not. said it's not Teddy Sears. Um, and so. Teddy Sears has said it's not Teddy Sears. It is not. There's a lot of outlets that are saying it is, but it is not. But Teddy Sears has said it's not <laughs> Teddy yes. Sears. So the so the intern so the the consensus on the internet 
And Will Wilkins sent this as well, uh, who's watching at home. Dilf man. Is that, uh, that it's a generic CG representation of the comic book character. That there's no actual actor so attributed nobody played to. It? Yeah. AI. Uh -oh. Welcome to the future, actors. This is what it's going to be for you guys. Flat GPT. Um, so yeah. What did you think, uh, Banff man? Um, I uh, lost my mom a handful of years ago, and so a guy doing whatever it takes, including ruining all the spaghetti verses to <laughs> spend a couple extra minutes with his mom just worked for me, and I didn't need anything else motivating, and then Michael Keaton showed up, and I was just in the bag for the rest of the movie. It didn't matter. I was there. Uh, I thought that uh, the motivation for Barry to ruin the multiverse was much better than the, mul than the reasons for Doctor Strange to ruin the multiverse in two movies. Wow. It's like Peter Parker just wants to go to college, so let's screw everything up. I get, at least I get Barry going after his mom. You got balls, dude. The internet's gonna come for you hard. They love that. They love seeing all them Spider Man. Like I, you know, I, 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 I no disrespect whatsoever, but like it, when Tobey Maguire showed up in No Way Home, I wasn't, I wasn't crying and shit because I, I didn't have an emotional attachment to Tobey Maguire Spider Man like I do to Michael Keaton as Batman. That being said, I understand people's emotional attachment to Tobey Maguire as Spider-Man. Like, fucking the theater I saw it in, people were like, ah, like Christ returned to Jerusalem and shit. <laughs> so I get it. Um, but, you know, for, for me, that's how I felt about seeing Michael Keaton return. It was like, holy shit, he's here. I can't believe it and stuff. So internet being what it is, the internet, fucking internet's all day long, for you to s fucking come at... Toby Maguire in any way, shape, or form. All I'm saying is, like, you should have somebody accompany you to your car when you leave here tonight. <laughs> I love Toby Maguire's Spider Man. That's my Spider Man. I just don't quite understand why Doctor Strange risked everything to get Zendaya into Harvard. <laughs> I know exactly why. Fucking Kevin Feige wanted it that way. <laughs> Which um, we saw in She-Hulk. They explained yeah, it, I yeah, guess. Exactly, that's the, exactly. Just F-E-I-G-E. -E. Um, yeah, so that's it, man. The Flash. Um, let me tell you, one of the th things about that movie was uh, watching... Like, you know, we've seen Michael Keaton Batman stand next to Catwoman. We've seen Michael Keaton Batman stand next to the Joker, stand next to Penguin. So we've seen him amongst comic book villains. It's the first time you ever got to see him standing next to a comic book hero. So seeing him in the same frame with The Flash and Supergirl just, like, did something for me. It reminded me of the TV Guide cover from when I was a kid where they put up the image of Michael Keaton Batman next to the image of Christopher Reeve next to the image of John Wesley Shipp as the Flash. And that was like as close as you were ever going to get to seeing Michael Keaton Batman standing next to another hero and shit. So seeing them like go down the hallway together when they were like leaving Russia and, and, and the one guy comes in and fucking Michael Keaton Batman goes like this and he doesn't flinch and he goes like that. It was just dope, man. Watching them fucking fight side by side was really cool. Um, I, I, for some reason, that, that was something I was not expecting that would please me. Uh, I would have been content to just watch a one-man show of Michael Keaton Batman. But seeing him stand next to the Flash in costume, his you know, fucking dark costume versus the Flash's very bright costume, just was a happy place for me a, a few times that it happened in the movie. Um, yeah. Watching him help the Flash try to become the Flash with a bat kite <laughs> was my happy place. <laughs> I don't know what, who made the choice that he should wear so many neckerchiefs, though, man. He's always <laughs> fucking... Very Thurston Howell the Ford. Yeah, really. Yeah, they're like, how do you dress a billionaire? Oh, I know, a neckerchief. 
I guess uh, that seems a lot like Back to the Future. Like you were talking back, that is Back to the Future, isn't it? They just made, put little Back to the Future in the middle of the movie. Back to the Future. Yeah, bad. Nice. Nice. Let's see what you did there. A dad joke the day after Father's Day. Well done. Hey. Um, That's right. my secret, Cap. I'm always dad joking. Um, speaking of dad jokes, we have another sponsor, kids. We do indeed. And who is it this time? Uh, this time it is... Oh, shit. Yeah. It is. Uh, yes, well guessed. Boy, you watch this show, don't you? <laughs> That's right, kids. Uh, before we dive into uh, Batman Forever, colon, the Schumacher cut, uh, we're going to talk about cutting ball hair. Trimming huevos, you guys. Uh, our our uh, next sponsor and our last sponsor of the evening uh, are the good folks at Manscaped. Give it up for the good folks at Manscaped, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Or, for the purposes of this show, Batmanscaped, man. If you haven't heard already, nice. it's smooth sack summer, kids. Did you hear that? <laughs> I was just talking to my wife about it today. Uh, when you're playing in the summer sun, make sure you've escaped from pubes to bum. That's right. This is the summer to keep your balls cool while still looking hot with Manscaped. The leaders in below-the-waist grooming are making sure we all have a ball this summer by giving our pants partners everything they need to stay fresh. Dive head first into smooth sack summer, my friends, by going to manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping with our code, which is, of course, FATMAN20. Take it away, Mark. Can we just take a moment to, to admire the punnage of that first paragraph? Yeah. Like, there's a lot of work in there, and I don't want them to think that we don't appreciate uh, how much rhyming was done there. Uh, thanks, Manscaped. Yeah, well done, man. Whoever writes this shit, ha hats yeah. off. Uh, the Manscaped Performance Package 4.0 has everything you need to prepare that summer bod. They have built the ultimate grooming bundle for your summer grooming. Well, let's see, they... It's grooming twice. We gotta criticize this as well. I what mean, the fuck, man? The this ain't the flash. You can write this shit, George. <laughs> Uh, their Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. That's oh. the last place you want a grooming accident right oh, there. Oh, dear God. The Lawnmower 4.0 has a 7,000 RPM motor. That's more RPMs than your car. It's more than my guys. moped that I drove in the 80s, that's for right sure. Right next to your balls. A new multifunction on off switch can engage a travel lock and gives you the ability to turn on the 4,000K LED spotlight on and off when you did signal Batman to shave his balls. Did he mention that the trimmer is waterproof too? <gasps> Beach, waterproof? lake, or shower, this razor will devour even the strongest pubes. Who is shaving their bush in the lake? <laughs> Fucking Jason Voorhees? <laughs> now that you have the perfect haircut, use Manscaped's liquid formulations to keep that freshness even at the hottest summer barbecues, man. Most importantly, use the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant to stay cool in the heat. With a soothing aloe vera formula, it's the best in the business for below the waist freshness. And this clear drying formula will keep looking good while smelling good as well. Manscaped even threw in two free gifts to their performance package 4.0. The Manscaped boxers and the shed travel bag. Wearing sandals with some nasty ass toenails during the summer months? Take a look at the Shears 2.0, a luxury nail grooming kit, which includes stainless steel nail cutters, tweezers, and grooming scissors. With the performance package, your balls will be ready to impress, but make sure you cover the rest with Shears 2.0. Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code FATMAN20 at manscaped.com. Go do it. We'll wait. Mm. Well, we got to go move on. Uh, that's 20% off plus free shipping with the code FATMAN20 at manscaped.com. It's smooth sack summer, boys. Get on board or get left behind. And we thank the good folks at Manscaped for sponsoring Fat Man Beyond. Give it up for them, kids. Uh, all right, so I have not seen the Schumacher cut yet. Um, so t tell me about it. Let me tell you about the secret origins of the Schumacher Ooh, cut. Oh, very nice. So uh, we were at uh, Smod Castle uh, Cinemas. I don't know if I ever mentioned this, but I own a movie theater. Um, um, where, where is it? In New Jersey, Atlantic ah. Highlands, New Jersey. Um, so we were doing, uh, before all the screenings that I attend or the functions that I'm involved in, 
Uh, we do auctions of like fucking signed stuff, of rare props, of like costume pieces, just whatever I've got uh, to augment the, the, what we pull in at the theater because film exhibition is a dying fucking medium right now. We bought a movie theater at the worst fucking time to buy a movie theater. So in order to keep the lights on, pay the staff and shit like that, uh, we tend to do these auctions. So uh, what was I auctioning? It was the Jersey Girl test scores. So I had a packet of test scores from Jersey Girl for like the first three or four screenings or something like that. And you know, I held on to these, I, I'm a pack rat, I hold, I'm like I'm a hoarder, they could put me on that show. And I hold on to shit forever, and so that night I was like, oh, somebody will fucking buy this and stuff. So some of them went for like real money, man. Somebody bought one of them for like 250 bucks. Which was awesome, because it was like, that bought my pain away from me. Because these test scores, <laughs> they were not fucking positive and shit. But one of them was the test, the first test that changed the fucking movie that made us take out all the Jennifer Lopez and stuff like that. So they were historical documents, man. Not so much that Nick Cage would go hunting for them one day and shit, but <laughs> definitely for like a movie buff. So my man, what is your name again? So Joe Black is there at the screening. Joe Black lives, you live out here, correct, Joe? So Joe lives out here, but he went back east for other things or just to see Jersey Girl? Just what? to see the... I know, fucking give it up for me. Travel the fucking world. Like Michael Shannon, he crossed an ocean of stars to fucking get... To kill this infant. <laughs> yes. To get to Smog Castle to watch the Jersey Girl, the Snyder Cut, we call it. The longest cut of Jersey Girl there ever was. So we're doing the auction, auction off the test scores. And during the auctions, it becomes an auction sometimes. People bid against each other, it gets real fun and shit. So Joe at one point was bidding, and he bid a number, I'm just gonna say like 100 bucks, but then he threw in, he goes, $100 and the Schumacher cut of Batman Forever. And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> Are you serious? And he was like, Bidding's yeah. over. So a lot of fuck, what is it? 69 bucks it was. So, mwah, perfect joke. The sexiest number there was. And a Schumacher cut of Batman Forever. So a lot of people online for the last two weeks since we spoke about it, mm. or last month when we spoke about it on the last streamed version of Fat Man Beyond, they're like, Kevin Smith's got the fucking cut. He has inside connections and shit. Joe has inside <laughs> connections. I, he just got a copy and he was fucking kind enough to throw it in. And so I was like, bam, I'll fucking take that all day long. So I got the cut from Joe. Joe got it from someplace else and we'll leave that there. You're not on camera, so you're all fucking good and shit. You don't care. Joe's like, fucking show my face. Come on up. Show me your fucking face real quick. This is our hero right here, kids. Give it up for Meet Joe Black right there. Yeah, go behind JC's thing. There he is. He keeps dodging every camera. Um, give a, do the Banff man cam and let's get a little background on this. Banff, uh, this is Joe Black, everybody. And to the home audience. Uh, Everybody, meet Joe Black. Yes. Joe Black, everybody. For the folks who are like, oh my God, fucking Kevin Smith will save us on the Schumacher cut. It, it's not Kevin Smith, Joe did it. What is your background history with this? Uh, I got to see a special screening of it somewhere and uh, I acquired it afterward. I actually tried to take footage from the 4K release of it and like put that over because a lot of it's still in there. But yeah, then, yeah. after like doing that for like a month, I got tired and I was like, it's fine. It is. It's utterly watchable. That's yeah. the first thing I'll say is like for a, a, you know, a fucking bootleg cut on a thumb drive and shit, it looks like it was taken off the Avid in 1995. It's dated because the movie goes back that far. But like it looks like an, it's utterly watchable. Yeah. It's, is it pristine? Like, no. It doesn't look like the Flash looked like this weekend. Mm. But... Can you, especially if you've seen this movie a bunch, and I've seen Batman Forever many times, um, is it utterly watchable? Absolutely. Now, I thought it was a clean cut. What was interesting about it, um, to me, aside from like all the added material, was it was at a point in the movie's life where they had the Batman March by Elliot Goldenthal, which they reused a couple times, but the rest of it was temp scored with, Tim, uh, with uh, Danny Elfman's Batman and Batman Returns score, as well as other movies. So yeah, when you like interview with the vampire music in it, there, there was interview yeah. with the vampire. Is that what it was from? Because yeah. I heard a lot of that shit. I was like, sounds familiar. When you're uh, cutting a movie together, you obviously the last thing you get to put onto a movie is the score, right? 
So if you're dealing with characters that have been in a movie prior to that, you could use the previous score from other movies. For example, when I was cutting together Jay and Silent Bob reboot, I was using uh, Jim Venable's score from Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back. And then he came in and created the new score once the movie was cut. So at this stage in the movie's life, um, before they start getting in there and hacking shit out, how long was this cut? Uh, it's not that much longer. It's like two and a half. It's like two hours and 35 minutes. Uh, yeah, I saw people on the internet going, it's a three-hour no, cut of the no. movie. I'm like, not really. No. But there was definitely extra stuff in it. But it was at a point in this movie's life where they must have shown it, they must have tested it, either showed it to movie execs back in, because this is 95 this fucker came out, or test screened it, and then decided right then and there, we're going to start bringing it in. Which I don't think it was conspiracy. I've read a lot of people online talking about how could they keep this movie down. The version I saw, and you back me up, feels like it was just cut for commercial considerations. That's it. Yeah, I mean, it, he doesn't Batman in this for the first like 15 minutes. Like the whole bit with like the Riddler, like meeting him, uh, you know, Edward Nick. That's how the movie starts after a John Favreau cameo. That's um, right, John Favreau's in it, which yeah. I don't know if he was in. The theatrical he, cut, the back just of as his John Favs, or uh, no, as yeah, as an introducing yeah, John Favreau <laughs> from Swingers. He plays Bruce's he, fucking. He, he just works for him. He's like t trying to close his the stocks deal before guy the or yeah. something like that. He's not Happy Hogan. No, but it's crazy though. He 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 has lines and shit, and and you're like, what the? And then you start wondering, like, wait, did I miss him in the other one? Um, but it's in a scene in uh, at Wayne tech or in his office yeah. in Bruce Wayne's office where his assistant is there and somebody else is there and they're coming at Bruce Wayne with a bunch of issues as Joe points out they he does not Batman for the first 15 minutes of the movie so one of the first things they do is take you to Arkham and show you Harvey Dent's origins including that piece of him in the courtroom where he leaps over and shit like that and they talk about him being there, and they show the doctor going down the hallway. Then they get to the cell, and I guess it's his guard has been killed, and he's hanging up and shit like that. Yeah, it's a weird spring-loaded contraption that I don't understand, but it somehow explains that Harvey escaped through a skylight. And there's something. like some kind of like... The bat must die. The bat must die is written on the wall and stuff. So definitely darker. Again, you got to remember... Batman Returns was so dark that, like, fucking McDonald's was like, we're not making Happy Meals with you guys anymore. <laughs> so the whole idea of Batman Forever was like, let's lighten this shit up. And so it feels like most of this shit was cut in deference to that, where they're like, look, it's called Batman Forever. Let's not make it forever until he gets in the movie. <laughs> and so they cut it, you know, to what we all saw, which was like, it opens, there's a title, and fucking, you know, Batman is, two faces robbing the bank and shit, and Batman is in there as quickly as possible. In this version, you got a two face, not origin, but like all this backstory that leads to his escape. And then you also meet uh, Edward Nigma and spend time with him, and that's the stuff that plays later in the movie. Was yes. there much extra added there? No, right? No, 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 no. I mean, there's a couple little things, like you see a little more of uh, Nigma working on closer, his machine. Closer, closer, closer. Working on his machine before he like meets him, but no, not really. Did they explain how Eddie, um, how Harvey Dent was a black guy once? No, <laughs> no. Is, is that part of the secret origin? I was waiting for that. I was like, when do they get into the Juneteenth of this shit? <laughs> like, but. They You're not, not black anymore. <laughs> Their explanation is right. blame Batman. That's what they say in the news. They, but they did that in the comics, though, I understand. Yeah? So in the Batman uh, 1989 yeah. books that they're doing for DC, I think it's, it's, it's uh, Billy, Billy D. Billy Williams. D. Yeah. And there's um, a cartoon movie, right, where, where they had the Billy D. Williams? In Lego Batman, one of the Lego Batman movies, Billy D. Williams was the voice of Two-Face, if I remember correctly. But no, they don't touch on that at all. Um, you know, I don't think they've added much new of, of uh, Tommy Lee Jones. No, he got screwed over the most, though, if you ask me. Because the big thing that you notice... By saying yes to the movie? or No, well, no. Uh, <laughs> but, like, what's really cool about this cut is that, like, you know, you talked about, like, who, you know, who someone's Batman is. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, Michael Keaton's Batman's the first movie I ever saw in a theater. So he's my Batman, even though, you know, I was age appropriate for Batman Forever for Val Kilmer, right. who I, I think my people my age reject him as their Batman in a weird way. But Tommy Lee Jones got a lot of flack for just being like a, 
uh, like over the top, goofy, whatever. Felt like he was trying to do Jack Nicholson's right, Joker. Right, right. But when you watch this cut, you realize they dubbed half of his shit in the movie. Because like it's the same footage, it's the same take, but the inflection is different in True. almost every line he has. Like the like one that I can really think of off the top of my head is when the Riddler first shows up and he's like in the in the theatrical cut, he goes, Who the hell are you? Like really big. If you listen to it, he straight up goes, And who are you? Like it's just it's a very direct kind of, you know You know what they also what I just remember too is the guy in the safe. Yeah. Where he's like, Oh my god, it's boiling acid. That's not in the right. cut at all. Yeah. Right. You don't say shit. They just no. take for granted that everyone's going to understand. Can you click. make this more like cats? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. It was crazy. It was like they did a test screening, and one person was like, I didn't get it. Was that acid? And they're like, we can fix that. <laughs> well, same like the guy in the alleyway, like the day glow like guy in the alleyway. Like, you know, people my age, we know that guy's voice. You know, that same, like, you know, Batman, you know. But in this, he's, hey, it's Batman. It's, it's so interesting the tone and Riddler's performance at the end too in his big like glittery outfit there it's the same shot but it's they dubbed it to make it bigger to make it more Jim Carrey and more and, more definitely leaning more into the like let's fun it up right which right. is why some of the opening why you would it is more reorganization of the opening of the movie there's definitely some sequences that aren't there and of course later on uh, uh, you know, everyone knows from the Batman Forever set of cards that image of Bruce Wayne facing the right. giant fucking bat. That sequence is in there. There's a part of, a, what is it, a, a diary of his parents, yes. his dad's diary, that he blames himself for the death of his parents. That's part of his, his trauma and stuff. Uh, because he wanted to go to the movies or whatever the fuck. And when, by the time he gets to the third act, he reads in the diary that his dad wrote that, like, I want to go see Zorro. And Bruce is like, it wasn't me. It was my idiot father who got us all killed. <laughs> well, that's kind of different, too, because in the movie, you know, when Two-Face and Riddler raid uh, Wayne Manor, they shoot him in the head. And in, and in the theatrical cut, he wakes up, and he's like, got to suit up in my sonar suit. In this one, when he wakes up, Alfred's like, the fucking bat cave's been destroyed and Bruce's like bat cave like what are you talking he lost his memory in yeah. this version and he has to like go into the cave and go into his psyche and that's when he faces the man bat and he comes out and he's like you know what I am Batman and the man you bat know? does look kind of cool oh my god it's, it's the like this, they spent a lot of money on it yeah. and it holds up when you see it like it, it flaps its wings and he it, they do big close ups on it and it's they go around him and Bruce very dramatically and stuff Spared but, no expense? No expense. But you could see why they took it out. Because once again, they're like, we got to get the kids back in this thing. And they I'm replaced not, it with karate laundry, yes. which is not in this that's cut. Not, that's right. No. This cut does not have Robin going like fucking laundry foo. You know, <laughs> fucking, oh, wow. swip, swip. This is how you dry. This is how you wash. And so they were like, we got to take the bat, the giant scary bat out. What should we put in? They're like, Kids love laundry. <laughs> <laughs> and they love karate. Kids love karate. What if we combine the two to show why this boy should be Robin or something? I'm saying, when I say boy, I'm being facetious. That was the other thing in watching this movie that I really forgot. Like, Chris O'Donnell is 86 years old in this movie. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, part of the poignancy of the Batman and Robin relationship, as Grant Morrison pointed out years ago on uh Fat Man on Batman, when it went before we were Fat Man Beyond, when it was just me one-on-one -on -one interviewing him, I made some crack about fucking the Batman and, and Robin relationship, real low-hanging fruit about like a guy and a kid and shit. And he fucking... Manscaped, you guys. Yes. <laughs> he, he got on me so fucking fast, uh, to be, and not, he didn't shame me, but he kind of did, to be like, it, it, I'm not even going to try to do his accent, but his whole point was like, no, that's one of the most touching relationships in comics. And I was like, touching? And he goes, no, fucking <laughs> not like that. He goes, like, the, the relationship is this. You have the boy who looks up to the man that he wants to be and the man who sees in the boy the childhood that he was denied. That's why their relationship is so symbiotic and so deep and beautiful. And in order for that to work, it should be a boy. Because there's no way a grown-ass man like Chris O'Donnell, like, you see him in this fucking movie, he's like two, two fucking days younger than Val Kilmer and shit. 
Well, the man. And they're like, we need to stick this orphan with you. And it's like, why? He's 28 years old, I'm sure. He goes to leave on his motorcycle that he rode to Wayne Manor. (laughs) Yes. Kid's got a license, man. He don't need no fucking help. Well, the one thing that the Schumacher cut couldn't fix, though, is like, I just, the whole third act, when they get to Riddler Island, Robin, first of all, is like useless. He gets captured twice. He does do holy rusted metal, though. Yeah, well, that yeah. joke is in every incarnation. Of I the mean, movie. it's so wow. good. How yeah. could it not be? Uh, <laughs> but uh, but he gets they they this cut doesn't fix that. And it also I will say in the theatrical cut, what this cut doesn't have is when he reconfronts Riddler and he's like, "Why can't I kill you?" When he's all like deformed on the floor. That's not in the in the Schumacher cut, and that's one of the best parts of the movie. And I and I I want like a perfect world where that scene goes back into the Incorporated Schumacher cut. It. Yeah, that's the one big criticism I had of that cut. The uh, him the bad morphing effect of him, you know, becoming like the mutated Riddler and stuff. I mean, you know, that it, again, I, I don't I can't do any fucking special effects, but like even I was like, ooh. He says bummer, and you think that that's like a criticism of the effect itself. Yeah. <laughs> I was really into this, and then... The, um, but it's... Would you say that it's a better version of Batman Forever? Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I, I, but I'm in that, that really insane minority where I actually think that Batman and Robin is better than Batman Forever. Oh, my God. If only... I know, I know. Well... Drink. Oh, <laughs> Fucking yeah. Mark needed to get a new drink just Whoa. for that comment. Sounds good. He was like, give me another Wakanda forever. Well, I want to hear this. Why? Tell me because why. Because I feel like that movie, like Batman Forever, which very obviously now after seeing this cut, Joel Schumacher's like, here's the movie I wanted to make. And they were like, we wanted to make a toy movie. So we're going to make your movie into a toy movie now. Yeah. And then Batman and Robin, he went, oh, you just want to make toys. Great. I'll do that. So I think that that movie is a little more like cohesive. Like that movie actually owns what it is for minute one. From the and beginning, it's not. And it Batman, hasn't been cut into yeah, a movie. And Batman it, Forever is kind of wishy-washy. It's it's kind of wants to be one thing, but it's forced to be something else. You had him, Joe. You had him for a while, and then you lost him. I don't need him. <laughs> well don't done, need him. Joe. Well done. I, don't um, I here's the thing, man. I a lot of people are like, uh, fucking. Uh, why won't they put this out? I, I don't know why any studio doesn't release as many versions of a movie as, as possible if a director wants to do so. Now, did Joel Schumacher ever go on record as saying, like, I wish they would put this version out? Because Joel Schumacher's gone, so we can't find out what his true wishes are. No, but you could ask Akiva Goldman. Who wrote the screenplay? He wrote the screenplay, but that's not, he's not the director, right? He's not the, the director. DGA might have something to say about that. Maybe, but then again, there's a studio that makes cuts of things all the time without a director's. All they got to do is Alan Smithy this shit if they wanted to. I think that's kind of the problem is that like, it would be the Schumacher cut, and after the Snyder cut was so successful, I think that's why you know, it was kind of like, hey, the, the people have been talking about the Schumacher cut, but Snyder could still make the Snyder cut. Right. Schumacher can't make the Schumacher cut. So it would, if anything, it would just be an assembly cut. And who knows if that would have been like what he, you know, ideally would have liked to have done. And that's the only thing that I would bump into is like, maybe Joel Schumacher was like, hey man, the the theatrical cut is the cut. And I don't want anybody to see the shit that we took out. Some directors are like that. I, 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 you know, as a fan of this shit and as a fan of cinema and filmmaking and just being interested in the process, I, I wish they would release it. Um, it it's, does the movie no shame. If anything, it fucking makes it, it enhances the experience of Batman forever. Um, and, you know, on a purely greedy corporate level, they get another bite at the apple, man. Like, there's, they can make some loot without putting a lot of loot into it. With Zack Snyder's Justice League, they had to put in $50, 70000000 million to get it viewable. You could literally just put this out as an addendum with Batman Forever and with second disc that just has this cut on it without spending another dime and probably make some loot on it uh, I, in, in physical yeah. media. I mean, I'm when's a, the 30th anniversary? Like, that feels like yeah, it's a two, pretty good chance. Is it com- coming up, right? Two years, yeah. Two, two years. years. So it's like, you know, brand new 4K restoration of Batman Forever plus Batman Forever Extended Edition. Mm-hmm. Don't even have to call it Schumacher Cut. We all know what it is. Mm. I'll say this version definitely fits in more with Schumacher's filmography, too, because, like, when you watch, like, 
the Lost Boys, and when you watch Flatliners and Falling Down, you could see why they hired that guy to do Batman. Good point. Batman Excellent is all point. three those of those. Those are some dark ass movies, yeah, and, and not like super dark, but right. for mainstream movies, they have an edge to it. And them. it's gothic, and it has the pageantry, and it has, and he was very hip. You know what I mean? He started, you know. It, 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 this fits in with those movies, you know, as it is now. It's like he made these really dope, cool movies, and then he got goofy for a while, you know, and then made Tigerland. I don't, you know, whatever he did. <laughs> oh my God, that. deep cuts. Yeah, well, they filmed that in my hometown. It was the first movie I ever saw being filmed. So it'll it was, always have a place in your heart. Like. Yeah, it'll always have a place back home. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but um, I showed it to my wife, who had never seen the uh, original cut of Batman, Batman Forever. Forever. And like me and my buddy were like freaking out at like everything, and she's like, "I am sure. Like, I'm glad yeah. you're having fun." All right. <laughs> that's true. I mean, that's the thing. It's not like for everybody. It's not going to change cinema and shit. But for an audience that wants it, and based on what I've seen for the last few weeks on the internet, after we fucking talked about it. There's an army of fucking people that really want to see it. There's an entire release the Schumacher cut movement that was tweeting and trending last week. And I think they might have trended today as well. It was in the L.A. Times. They talked about it in the L.A. Times that you, that you had this cut of it. So like, Did they? Yeah. I mean, there were a lot of news pieces like comicbook.com, of course, and shit like that. I saw it go to A.V. Club. and you, Normally, A.V. Club is always writing shitty things about me. And so this time they didn't, they just wrote an indifferent, he has the cut kind of thing. Uh, and you know, I was like, oh, but where's the fucking, where's the, the upper cut? But they didn't, they didn't do that. They were just like, he has the cut. He says he's seen it. I see some of the reports were like, Kevin Smith claims to have it. Who would fucking make that claim? Like, what am I trying to get laid or something? Like, ladies, guess what I have? I've also seen the thing where people are saying it's like Warner Brothers is working with you to like pretend like it's a conspiracy thing. And I'm a huge Hollywood conspiracy theorist. I think it's all evil. But like, <laughs> this, but like this is like, no, like it's just you actually have those. And I'll be honest movies. with you, nobody has reached out. For all those articles, you would imagine somebody at Warner Brothers would be like, do you fucking have something that belongs to us? Can we have it back? Yeah. And they still let you into a premiere of a yeah. Warner Brothers movie. <laughs> Literally, man. And it wasn't an elaborate trap to be like, he's here. Yeah, Pounce. <laughs> I hadn't even thought of that shit. Because <laughs> I did get invited to the premiere rather late, and it was after I talked about the Snyder Cut. God, I'm so naive. We have something over. We got vegan cake right over there. Yeah, I'm like, really? Vegan cake? <laughs> Slam. I'm like Joe Pesci, like, oh, no. Fucking <laughs> down I go. Why do you I'm, have socks with those oranges in them? I mean, the reason I shared it with you is because when I first met you uh, 10 years ago, like three days ago, Facebook reminded me of it. I met you three days ago, 10 years ago. And uh, I told you then that it was on, like, my bucket list to see your original cut of Jersey Girl. Like, that was, you know. And then uh, I was invited to an early uh, screening of Clerks 3. And Can we tell that story? I mean, if you want to, it's fine. But so we have, the, we, Joe and I, we had an early screening of Clerks 3. Um, and it was the second one we did. Lionsgate put it together. And it was pretty much curated. We didn't, like, do an open you know, go up to the fucking mall and ask strangers to go. It, it was off of, like, the, off of the Kevin's, that Kevin Smith Club or off of, like, uh, the website. And, you know, basically, you had to kind of be familiar with my stuff and be kind of into it. They, they weren't getting strangers cold to ask what they thought about the third movie in a series that they were not familiar with to begin with. So we have this screen. It's about 100 people or something like that. And you know, afterwards, uh, everyone's applauding and shit, and I get up to do like an informal kind of uh, Q&A slash focus group. And so I was like, uh, all right, man, how many, and Lionsgate's sitting in the back. So uh, I go, how many people like the movie? And, and everyone's hands go up or everybody applauds, whatever the fuck. And I was like, well, just, you know, for fucking my own edification, is there anyone that didn't like it? And fucking Joe's hand went up. And so, so I was like, well, this, we got to fucking dive into this. And Joe gave a, a, a very passionate uh, criticism of the movie. He was like, I, if I remember correctly, it was like, you betrayed your audience and yourself. <laughs> and I say with all the love in my heart for you and your work, I still feel that way. Yeah, he don't, but, he don't like but, Clerks but 3 here's what I'll at say. all. No, but I, I'll, can I tell him this part? Etta, who was like our exec at Lionsgate, after the screening, 
Uh, she was like, I was, you know, as soon as you went up there to do your, your Q&A, she was like, I was getting up to go home because I'd seen you do the Q&A before and I heard the movie play so I knew everything was fine. She was like, the moment that boy started talking, I sat the fuck down. <laughs> She was like, I really wanted to know how this was going to go. And, and they were like mystified. Lionsgate people were like, why did you put up with that? Like, why, why, why would you let him do that? And I was like, he fucking, he was clearly, he was a fan. Like, it, it, he loved Clerks too, and I love Clerks too. So I, I couldn't be like, well, just because he didn't like Clerks 3 means that his opinion is validated. You know, especially if like I share the same feeling. But I, where we differ is, I love Clerks 2, and I felt like Clerks 3 was an extension of Clerks 2. Joe did not feel that way at is all. There any way, is there any way I could tell you kind of like... I, I sent you the email that you requested. Did you ever get it? I... It was 13 pages. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Uh, secret, he never checked I, 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 I If you want to see it, I turned it into an hour-long video essay that I released about it. Did you? Be yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, like, it, but again, out of, completely out of love, and I mean that. Right, right, right. And I just want to say... <laughs> the toughest love there is, Joe, 13 pages. Well, you're, you, I mean, you're an artist reaching to millions of people, man. Yeah, like, yeah. you're, you know, you're a god to us. You know what I mean? You really yeah. are. Well, but I, so, a god that it, must it, be killed. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, that... But see, God that's what I felt the perspective kids. was of your movie. But I, right. is there any way I could just share with you a, like a fan fiction version of how, what I would have done at the end? I'll take it. I'll so, take it. Look, I'm a Kevin Smith fan. I want to hear it. Go. So Dante, Dante yelling at Randall, right? Yeah. Randall has the second heart attack. Yes. And in, in, in my mind. Yes. So Randall has a second heart attack. He's, you know, and Dante refuses to go to the hospital because he fucking hates Randall at this point. And Elias gives him shit about it. And puts him in his place, kind of like the reverse of what happens. Dante has to go and figure out how to edit this movie. And in editing the movie, he realizes, oh my God, this is Randall's love letter to me and my friendship, and this is him trying to get me back into the world. Right. He goes into the hospital, he shows Randall the movie, and Randall dies, and he, he tells him, I, you love me, I, you, know, you see the world in your own way, and thank you for bringing me back alive. Randall dies, he has the funeral, then Dante just enters it into some festivals or something. The movie actually becomes a big hit. And you end the movie with a kid coming into the quick stop, looking around and asking, hey, I'm sorry, but is, is this where Randall Graves shot Inconvenience? And Dante then shares with him the story of his friend whose perspective inspired that kid to make movies. Because that's what you really did. That's, that's what you did in real life. And yes. I, think that that's why, I think that's why Clerks 3 like, hit me the way it did, because I felt like you're killing off that side of you that, like, that you've spoken about. And I mean, we're all here because of both sides of you, working in tandem. And to kill off the one that like, cared for people was weird for me. And it still hits me in that way. But, but, like, but my perspective yeah. was that the side that didn't care for people aged into caring for people. I get that And the guy who I've been trying to kill for fucking 30 years yeah. I finally got to kill. Because remember, I wanted to kill him in the very first movie and shit. And that was a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you're right. It was a bad idea. I'm so sorry, much I so didn't mean, I didn't mean to be rude. I love you to death. No, I, I know, and but, I respect but you're right. Your work. It, it was yeah. a bad idea so much so that we, we cut it. But for me, that felt like like the closure. I, 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 like, I got it's... nothing but respect for the notion of, like, I, I in fact like the idea of a scene where somebody comes in and is like, hey man, is this where they made that shit? That's flowery Jersey girl era shit. You it, know, that's a, little, the, a little bit. But, which I um, loved, by but the way. I, but I, um, I know, he, 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 but, the, the, but after we showed the Snyder Cut, Joe's take on it was, he, which I thought was cool, he was like, you were right to cut all this shit. He's like, your commercial instincts made more sense. Like, the version that you released to the world of Jersey Girl is better than this longer cut. You attempted a James L. Brooks, and you landed on a great John Hughes. That's, oh, how, that's how I feel. And I wanted to say, you said beforehand, you talked about uh, you and Vilmos, um, who I met one time at Arclight, and he said, how do you recognize me? I said, from the Jersey Girl documentary. And he was like, oh, God. And, and I... <laughs> and, uh, and I, You're fucking killing me, no, Joe. Here's a, no, no, here, no, here's a true story. He said to me, he said, do you want a picture with me? I said, sure. And he took, he took my phone and he framed a shot of us. Vilmos Zygmunt, he died like a week later. After so, taking a selfie with you? Like that's, he died a week later. All I know, that could be the last, 
We've just had you on the show for 20 minutes. That, that could be the last frame that Vilmos ever shot. It could but, be. But uh, that sh you talked about how he was, you know, you wanted to do close-ups. And he was like, I lit all these wide shots. And I lit, you know, yeah. and you said, I love my dialogue. I want the close-ups. Don't disagree. But there's a shot in this version that's not in the theatrical cut of Ben Affleck on an elevator when he's going up to the... You uh, saw, yeah, you said yeah, that. You that like shot that. communicates thematically and emotionally everything that you've done to that point, not only in the movie, but in your career. And it's, it's one of your finest moments. And you know what I noted? It's a wide shot with no dialogue. It is true. You're better than, you're better than you give yourself credit for. No, I'm That's, not, Yes, Joe. you are. Yes, you absolutely no, are. No, I'm not. The night that you, ha the day that you had your heart attack, the day that you had your heart attack on the uh, silent but deadly, yes. you ended that by saying, I'm not talented. Yes. And, that it, and I... Could not disagree more. We are here because of your talent, because of your vision. You are the best. Thank and I mean you. that. Thank you. Give it up for Joe, everybody. Bamf. Bamf man is back, yes. So, so I shit you not, maybe two weeks ago, I deleted the video I shot of your Q&A from that clerk's thing, because I was like, there is no way that dude will ever get in the room with Kevin Smith again. <laughs> <laughs> so I deleted it off the computer and like I have faith that like peace in the Middle East can happen because you guys were able to reconcile. Nobody outside of I think Shannon was in that room except Who's for here tonight. The, you guys were, were you guys was that not the most uncomfortable <laughs> room you've ever been in in your life? This but is it this was, is incredible. But I treated I did tr I treated him with respect though. I was not like yeah. Shut no, the it up. was just weird to see somebody in a room full of three hundred or hundred and fifty people just be like that fucking sucked. <laughs> to the dude who did it. I don't know. I'm but, used to that kind of thing. Uh, wow. It's just usually the numbers are flipped. It's like <laughs> one person likes it and everyone shits on it. That was the one day where I was like, oh my god, I think I got everybody. And Joe was like, hold my beer. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, I'm, I'm impressed. Yeah, what do you got? I've, I've written and directed 15 feature films because of you. And that's my newest one. This is, uh, Joe said he's written and directed 15 feature films yeah. because of him. He gave me credit, but you did it. And this is, what is it called? It's called Natasha Hall. It's available on Amazon. It stars my wife. Natasha Hall, and it's available on Amazon, and it stars Joe's wife. I will totally watch. I'll totally watch this because I trust you now. There was a part of me when you gave me a thumb drive that I'm like, I'm going to stick this in my computer. It's going to be child porn and the government's going to show up. And that's his revenge for Clerks 3. But once I saw that it was Batman Forever, I'll trust anything you put in my hands now. <laughs> Thank you. It was amazing. Um, all right, to sum up on, on uh, the Schumacher cut. Uh, Warner Brothers should absolutely put it out. A lot of people have been asking me online, like, you should distribute it. And apparently they don't understand <laughs> legalities, copyrights, and shit like that. But I will say this. Uh, I cannot uh, uh, fucking... Sh uh, I got a movie theater, but I can't, like, sell tickets to something that I don't own. Uh, however, my movie theater I live at, so it's technically also my house. <laughs> so... Um, we're doing, uh, what is it? I'll give you two bites of the apple. July 1st, we're doing uh, Clerk's Cartoon Marathon. It is, uh, at, it's called Bear is Driving, the Clerk's Cartoon Marathon. Brian O'Halloran's gonna be there. Jeff Anderson's gonna be there. We're showing all six episodes of the Clerk's Cartoon, which is more than ABC did. They showed two and canceled it and shit. Um, if you're there for that, there's like, I, we've sold, uh, I think we're at 170 tickets, so there's like 50 tickets left to sell it out. If you're there, once we're done, at midnight, maybe we'll watch a movie. For free. I ain't charging, so if you're there, you stay afterwards, we'll watch a movie. Here's the second bite at the apple. On August 25th, we're gonna do Fat Man Beyond, at Smod Castle Cinemas. We did it in March, we're gonna do it again in August, August 25th, tickets have been on sale for a while now. I think we're at about 140 tickets right now. Once our show is done, if you stick around, 
we're going to watch something else. I'm not going to say what it is, but it's probably the Schumacher cut of Batman Forever. <laughs> not charging for it, so I don't want to hear shit from Warner Brothers and stuff, but for the people that are really interested, because there are a fucking legion of people online who are like, release it, please put it up online. And I, that's ridiculous. I'd get sued the pants off of. But if I showed it on my fucking laptop or my version of a laptop is a fucking Barco projection system in a 230-seat theater, as long as I don't sell tickets, I believe I can do it. I'm sure I might hear differently from a lawyer somewhere down the line. But there it is. You go to either of those two shows, stick around afterwards, we'll all watch it together. I have a higher resolution. You have a higher resolution version? We'll watch a better fucking version of it. It has to fit on the thumb drive. That's true. All right, yeah, man, fucking get me that. Done and done. Uh, so there it is. If you're at home and you're like, I want to see the Schumacher cut, two, play, two ways for you to see it at Smog Castle Cinemas. We're not charging you for it. It's a free screening, uh, but you got to be there for the other shit and whatnot. So make of that what you will. Now there's going to be a host of articles tomorrow being like, Kevin Smith gets sued by Warner Brothers. <laughs> and we'll never be allowed to see the Flash sequel. <laughs> yeah, what Flash sequel indeed. Um, all right, we're done with the Schumacher cut? Hey. Let's move on to other things. Give it up for Joe, man. He, we, I wouldn't have had that without Joe. Uh, do we have news to dive into? We have a handful. Uh, before we dive into news, uh, speaking of Smog Castle Cinemas, uh, I will be there in two weeks. Next week, I won't be at Smog Castle Cinemas or here. I'm going to Michigan for Astronomicon. Uh, me and a bunch of you, it's almost like a Viewisk Universe takeover of Astronomicon. I was supposed to be there a few months ago, but weather uh, froze the Detroit airport, and so we couldn't go. So they're making it up uh, in uh, next weekend. And it's me and Jason Muse and Brian O'Holler, Jeff Anderson, Jason Lee. Uh, I think Ethan Suplee's going. Harley's going to be there. This is the first time my wife Jennifer is going to a con as well. Uh, Austin, who played Blockchain. Trevor, who plays Elias. So if you're in the Michigan area, it's in Livonia particularly, uh, it's Saturday and Sunday. Then the following weekend, we have a big signing at Jane Silent Bob's Secret Stash uh, for these two books. So you know I do comic books, right? Uh, Secret Stash Press did a book called Masquerade, and we did a book called Quick Stops. This is the hardcover that are, it comes out in like two weeks. I guess you can order it wherever you order your comic books. We'll be selling them signed at the stash. These are the fucking nicest things anyone has ever made of my comic books. Fucking hardcover, no slip cover on top of it. Just fucking dope. Dark Horse makes a really nice book. So we're having a signing at the Secret Stash. Can't get tickets anymore. It's all sold out for Saturday and Sunday, um, where we sign Masquerade and Quick Stops hardcover. Then, as I mentioned before, at night at Smog Castle Cinemas on July 1st, we're doing the Bears Driving Marathon, the Clerks Cartoon Marathon. And then afterwards, we're going to watch a movie that I don't own. Um, <laughs> the very next night, we're doing the Blues Brothers. That's July 2nd. Then, this is almost sold out, July 29th, we're celebrating my birthday. My birthday's August 2nd, I'm gonna turn 53, but it's on a Wednesday, nobody goes to the fucking movies on a Wednesday. So July 29th, the weekend before, we're doing a birthday event that is uh, us reading the Superman Lives script uh, in front of a live audience, the longest uh, version of the Superman Lives script. And I'm working on getting somebody cool to read it with us and stuff. And no, it's not gonna be Nick Cage. <laughs> A lot of people are like, get Nick Cage. I'm like, if I could get Nick Cage for anything, it would be Tusk 2. You know, like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna blow it for fucking a Superman script reading. Um, but uh, that is July 29th, and I think there's 10 tickets left to that. All these tickets are available at smockhousecinemas.com. Then, as we mentioned before, August 25th, Mark returns to the East Coast, and we do Fat Man Beyond uh, live from Smod Castle. Uh, Banff Man will be holding down the fort out here and streaming in as he did last time. We had a good time. Then the next night, we're doing a, um, uh, Mark had a, made a joke last time we did the show about, uh, we should do a Tim Curry film festival called Keep Calm and Curry On. And uh, we are not doing a whole f festival, but we are doing a double feature. So August 26th, 
for one price, you can come to Smart Castle and you can watch Clue, and then me and Mark will get up and do a Q&A for a movie we had nothing to do with. <laughs> and then the second movie is Legend, Ridley Scott's Legend, where Tim Curry plays the devil. So that's the shit that I got to sell. Also, uh, I'm coming to Knoxville, Tennessee for Fanboy. That's the follow That's uh, July 8th or 9th, I believe it is. And then I'm also going to Shreveport, Louisiana for GeekCon, and that's in August. So there. Sometimes we don't sell Manscaped or Blue Chew. Sometimes we say, yes, can you believe it? <laughs> Sometimes we sell a little bit of Kevin Smith. So that's all the ways you can see me if you're not here or if you're not in New Jersey. Uh, now, uh, Mark Bernardin here used to be a newsman, kids. And, uh, you know, since the fucking writer's strike, he's not been allowed to fucking ply his trade as a writer. So he's gone back to being a newsman. Uh, and he's got all the news for you. Give it up for Mark Bernardin. He's got some fucking news! News! Uh, all right, I have, I have two stories left. Uh, both are about Marvel Comics. Ooh. One of them is, uh, is interesting, the other one is sad. Which oh. would you like to do first? Uh, interesting first. Interesting. Um, there's a new Stan Lee documentary that dropped on... It's on Disney Plus, right? Disney Plus. Plus. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm fancy as fuck, so Disney Plus. Um, and it turns out that some previous collaborators with Stan have issue with the amount of ownership he takes over all of the creations that came out of Marvel during the time he was well, editor in chief. Took. Took. Well, I sadly, mean, Stan takes nothing anymore. He takes nothing anymore, but this documentary does position things in a, in a certain way. Um, and so Neil Kirby, who is Jack Kirby's son, asked his daughter Jillian to post a statement in response to the Stanley documentary that recently dropped. Here are a couple of pertinent excerpts from said statement. Let me guess, he's very happy. Thrilled to pieces. I understand that as a documentary about Stan Lee, most of the narrative is in his voice, literally and figuratively. It's not any big secret that there has always been controversy over the parts that were played in the creation and success of Marvel's characters. Stan Lee had the fortunate circumstance to have access to the corporate megaphone and media, and he used these to create his own mythos as to the creation of the Marvel character pantheon. He made himself the voice of Marvel. So for several decades, he was the only man standing and blessed with a long life, the last man standing. Um, his father, Jack Kirby, died in 1994. If you were to look at a list and timeline of Marvel's characters from 1960 through 1966, the period in which the vast majority of Marvel's major characters were created during Lee's tenure, you will see Lee's name as co-creator on every character, with the exception of Silver Surfer, solely created by my father. Are we to assume Lee had a hand in creating every Marvel character? Are we to assume that it was never the other co-creator that walked into Lee's office and said, Stan, I have a great idea for a character? According to Lee, it was always his idea. Lee spends a fair amount of time talking about how and why he created the Fantastic Four, with only one fleeting reference to my father. Indeed, most comics historians recognize that my father based the Fantastic Four on a 1957 comic he created for DC, Challenges of the Unknown, even naming Ben Grimm after his father, Benjamin, and Sue Storm after my older sister, Susan. I was very fortunate. My father worked at home in his Long Island basement studio we referred to as The Dungeon, usually 14 to 16 hours a day, seven days a week. Most of the artists, writers, inkers, etc., worked at home, not in the Marvel offices, as, de as depicted in the program. Through middle and high school, I was able to stand on my father's left shoulder, peer through a cloud of cigar smoke, and witness the Marvel Universe being created. I am by no means a comic historian, but there are few, if any, that have personally seen or experienced what I have, and know the truth with first-hand knowledge. My father retired from comic books in the early 1980s and, of course, passed away in 1994. Lee had over 35 years of uncontested publicity, much naturally with the backing and blessing of Marvel as he boosted the Marvel brand as a side effect of boosting himself. The decades of Lee's self-promotion culminated with his cameo appearance in over 35 Marvel films, starting with X-Men in 2000, thus cementing his status as the creator of all things Marvel to an otherwise unknowing movie audience of millions, unfamiliar with the true history of Marvel comics. My father's first screen credit didn't appear until the closing crawl at the end of the film adaptation of Iron Man in 2008 after Stan Lee, Don Heck, and Larry Lieber. The battle for creator's rights has been around since the first inscribed Babylonian tablet. It's way past time to at least get this one chapter of literary art history right. Nuff said. Whoa. Uh, Thoughts? 
I mean, I am also not a comics historian, um, but the, the, the legends we've all heard of Stan as the greatest salesman in the world of, especially Stanley, yeah. um, do not seem to contradict that accounting of things. Um, time also has a way of um, recasting the lies one tells themselves as truth. And so I am not to say one way or another who did what to whom, who did what right and what wrong, but I think it is clear that the parentage of the Marvel Universe is not as clear cut as we've all been led to believe. Mm. Um, a lot of people have always said, this is, I didn't invent this quote, other smarter people said it first, but uh, the greatest creation of Stan Lee was Stan Lee himself. And uh, one thing is for sure, uh, whether or not he is truly the co-creator of all these Marvel characters, um, he certainly uh, knew how to sell those characters. And he knew how to sell himself in the process. And when he was doing this, comics were in a multi-billion dollar business. They were uh, an art form. They weren't even considered an art form, really, at that point. Uh, it was disposable, cheap entertainment for children. So, you know, I don't think the dude had some sort of insidious master plan to steal credit from people. I think he knew how to sell and went out there and sold. And, you know, is it easier to sell by being like, uh, I came up with this shit. And it's not like he said, I and I alone came up with it. The guy never claimed to be an artist, right? Uh, and it depends on what you think, where creation begins. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, Michelangelo did David, the sculpture of David, right? Mm -hmm. But somebody said, hey, you should do a sculpture of David, and we'll give you money. He was like, oh, all right. So did the person who commissioned the statue of David truly come up with the statue? Who's the creator in that instance? Um, you know, it's, it's a slippery fucking slope. I, I, I talk about my work, and I've never been like, you know, I created Jay and Silent Bob purely from my imagination. I created Silent Bob from my imagination. Jay is based on Jason Mewes, as has proven out like over the years, and as I've said in front of him, behind his back all the time and stuff. Um, I never take the a film by credit for that reason, because it tends to leave out everybody else in the process. It's a little misleading. I'm not saying others shouldn't do it, but for me, I'm never comfortable because it takes a village to make a movie and stuff. Uh, when Stan was out selling comics, tub thumping for comics back in the 60s and 70s, I think he was just trying to do it as you know efficiently as possible. And the subtle nuances of like, well, I, I created these characters with artists and what happens is sometimes an artist comes into your office and they have an idea and then you tell them to go draw it and then I was the one who dialogued it and came up with all the backstory. And blah, blah. It's a very long explanation when it's just easier to say like, I created, or at least in my lifetime, I never heard him say he created as much as he said he co-created. And if people gave him credit, he generally, again, in my lifetime while I was around, quickly corrected them to say like, well, it was me and Steve Ditko, it was me and Jack Kirby. Um, now, that was probably after years of pre-internet of the st other creators being like, Jesus, where's all the credit I'm getting? Or I should be getting from my contributions to these characters, which you know probably became a bigger issue once these characters took on the longevity that they would then show. Um, a lot of people back in the early days of comics didn't want to even cop to the fact that they worked in comics because they were trying to work in other fields and comics was just a side hustle and whatnot. Uh, in a world where these characters lived on and became part of the pop cultural landscape and a new American mythology and then later on, you know, profitable, uh, billion dollar fucking characters. Uh, naturally, of course, you want to make sure that everyone who was involved has their due and gets the credit their, their, uh, their due. Uh, I, I don't think Stan Lee was a villain. Maybe I just want to believe that about a guy who I met late in his life who perhaps learned from his mistakes in the past about not crediting everybody as clearly as he could have and stuff. Um, 
But all I know is the guy I knew from 1995 on was very quick to give out credit to all the people that he worked with. Um, and that's, I think, all I could say about that. I mean, I also think that, that part of the issue that, that Neil Kirby has is that the documentary, specifically, is a very one-sided documentary. It's a documentary about Stan. It's a documentary about Stan, and it's telling... It's not, it's not comics history. It's just the story of Stan Lee. Right. And so the perspective of that story is coming from Stan. Um, clips that they use to tell the narrative are all Stan's clips. Right. And so to him, that gives you a somewhat skewed perspective on what the truth was. Right. And what is a documentary's relationship to and responsibility for the truth. Um, which I don't have an answer for. I didn't make that movie. As a journalist, you try and endeavor to get as close to what happened as possible. But documentary is still, even based on fact, based on a true story is never a true story. Yeah. You know, like documentary. The key word here is story. Right. You know, there's always some element of fiction, even in a documentary. How you choose to order things changes the audience's perception on those things. Um, so I think that's, that's his big beef, is specifically with this documentary at this time, which seemed to pull off an old wound that led him to, to recant the tales of his perspective on the creation of the Marvel Universe. Um, I guess we all get a chance to watch that documentary ourselves. It's on Disney Plus. It's on Disney Plus. Bamf. Bamf Man is here. I'll, right. I'll also say this, like, as somebody who's done a lot of video editing, um, and as somebody who's put out short films, who's done interviews, who's had, I've had my words edited, I've gotten into issues with friends where it was like, I wrote this, I said like, I wrote this short film with XYZ, and then in the printed article on Nerdist, it's like, writer of this short film, J.C. Reifenberg, mm. and they come after me, and I was like, well, that's not what's on her tape recorder but they don't know what I said, and now I'm a villain. And I'm not saying that Stan Lee always credited everybody all the time, but the video gets edited to match the narrative of the filmmaker making it. The interviews he's done for, what, 50, 60 years get, there's 500 words that can go into a thing, and he talked for, you know, half an hour, and they have to cut it down and hit a space in the margin and a lot of that stuff can get left behind and then people get shitty with you when you were like well i i said co-creator with this person and then that just falls away because it's not part of the story the journalist wants to tell there was a just today i had a mini version of this where there was an article i did an interview with rolling stone about uh nick cage superman and spider-man and, and the flash and and you know it was more, it wasn't like, uh, this is earnest news. You know, I was fucking being pithy and making jokes and shit like that. And so uh, the journalist uh, brought up, like, uh, some people online are pissed about the cameos in Flash in the third act, the George Reeves of it all, the Christopher Reeve, the uh, Adam West, so forth. And uh, I said, yeah, I didn't bump into that. I, so I, I'm, and again, I'm not quoting myself exactly, but essentially I was saying, like, I saw that as homage. That didn't bother me in the least. I saw it as homage, and then I pivoted right to the joke where I was just like, look, like most actors get in this to be seen and to live forever, you know, relevancy. Like, and most actors I know, and, or I think I might have said, I don't know a single actor, which is essentially the same version of most actors I know, uh, who would not want to be remembered after they were fucking dead. And I was like, look, as far as I'm concerned, you could fuck, I hope to God somebody puts me in shit after I'm dead. I said, I've been spending my last 30 years trying to fucking keep my face in the public eye and be relevant, so you could stick my dead ass in porn after I'm fucking <laughs> gone. And so, you know, again, this wasn't an earnest fucking, like, 60 Minutes interview or something like that. It was a pithy Rolling Stone article. And somebody was just, like, uh, kind of came at me about uh, George Reeves and brought up, like, George Reeves' suicide. And, uh, you know, is, is that cameo of George Reeves' Superman respectful to a man who took his own life because he couldn't get any roles after Superman. And they were kind of taking the position that 
I was like, you know, every actor should be used in perpetuity, whether they want to or not, whatever the fuck. And, you know, I simply do put like four fucking tweets, and I put after, I said, look, I agree with your second tweet. My take on it is the same. Like, you can't use an actor unless somebody signs off on it, either the actor themselves or their estate. So we're kind of on the same page. Why are you coming at me? And then the dude took his tweet down because he was like, oh, I didn't read the article. And I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck, man? <laughs> like you, you read had one job. <laughs> exactly. You read the headline and came at me and shit like that. So it's, I'm not saying this is all a game of telephone, and I don't think we're sitting here trying to be Stanley apologists as much as my heart would like to be a Stanley apologist because I liked him quite a bit. But he wasn't the only person telling his story. And in the instance of this documentary, he's not even here to fucking tell his story anymore. Um, you know, I, like JC said, you could say a bunch of things to a fucking journalist and they're going to print what works for them. And, you know, if you sit there, I've sat there and gone out of my way to over explain shit. Anybody who's been at a fucking Q&A of mine or even watch this show, like, knows that I could put a lot of fucking words together and be as clear as fucking day. And then the next day online, somebody will take fucking one thing I said and turn it into a fucking article that represents nothing of what I truly said. So I'm not saying Stan's a victim here, not by any stretch of the imagination. As I began with, Stan was an incredible salesman. And I respect all the work he did in selling comic books as a viable art form for all those years before the rest of the general public caught up. And I also respect his ability to sell himself in the process. In the process of selling himself, did it sell others short? Perhaps. I don't think that was in his intention. Uh, but if he did, like I said, in the years that I knew him, he always seemed to try to make up for that. He was always the first to correct even me in conversation, where I'd talk about, like, well, it was Spider-Man's baby daddy. And he would be like, not just me, Steve Ditko, and, you know, so forth and so on. So uh, it, it's, I get where the letter comes from, mm -hmm. uh, a particularly point in piece as a kid talking about, I saw the birth of the Marvel Universe through a haze of fucking cigar smoke. And there is no secret that, like, Jack Kirby, just like Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster, like so many, like Steve Ditko, so many comic creators, got fucked, you know, not necessarily by Stan Lee, but by the corporations that own their work. There was a recent thread going through Twitter last week, comics broke me. Mm -hmm. And it's from a bunch of people who work in the field, artists who are getting incredibly underpaid to draw comic book pages and ink them and color them and shit. Um, and how people have put into a lot of work into the field and, you know, it's, it's taken more from them than, it, than they've gotten from it. And, it's, it was predicated on the death of, a, of an artist. Anybody know the artist's name? I'm sorry, I didn't deep dive enough. I should have come prepared. But he was young and uh, in his 30s or something, and I, he passed away. I'm, I'm not sure quite how, but his death prompted this, this uh, hashtag that went on for almost a full week. Comics broke me. And a lot of people kept bringing up Jack Kirby because Jack Kirby apparently has a very famous quote um, where he said to somebody in an interview or he said to somebody who was coming up through Marvel, comics will break your heart, kid, as they seemingly broke his. You're talking about a master of the, not just comic book art form, but of graphic arts in general. And arguably, uh, Jack Kirby created such dynamic work that it forced people to look at comic books differently uh, in his lifetime. And I remember a long time ago being a Stan Lee kid, like back, and this is like 1995, I was doing press on Mallrats, Stan Lee was in Mallrats. And, you know, I've made the mistake of saying something like, you know, Jack Kirby, I never understood Jack Kirby's art. And I remember Alex Ross, like, said publicly in, in an article, he was like, I'll explain it to you, Kev because he knew how important Jack Kirby was as an artist. I've always been a wordsmith. I love comic books, but the first thing I look at, oddly enough, is not the pictures, it's the word balloons and stuff. So I was always more inclined toward the writing than the visual aspect of it, which I'm sure is gonna get me chewed a new asshole on the internet. 
But I've since learned and I've since grown. That's the beauty of fucking being alive and you know, staying alive is that it gives you the chance. Every day is a fucking school day and you could correct mistakes as you go forward and, and become more educated and stuff. So I, for my money, I don't think Stan was ever trying to rob anybody of credit. In the process though, people have been robbed of credit, not just by Stan, they've been flat out robbed by the corporations that own these characters as well. You know, Bill one of the, what's that? Bill Finger. Bill Finger. Look how long it took fucking Bill Finger to get credit for his work. And that wasn't him versus Big Bad Warner Brothers. That was him versus fucking Bob Kane. Bob Kane, the creator of Batman, went out of his way to deny Bill Finger credit for decades all throughout his life until both of them were gone. And then suddenly Warner Brothers and DC were like, well... Maybe we got to include Bill Finger on this. Uh, and now every shitty. Batman thing going forward says, used to just say Batman created by Bob Kane. Now it says Batman created by Bob Kane with Bill Finger, I believe. So, you know, as comics become more prominent, and they've never been more prominent than they have been in the last 10, 20 years with movie technology, special effects technology catching up to the point where you can depict the imaginations of some of the most creative fucking artisans that ever walked the planet and shit. Uh, credit, now more credit is being extended because more people are finding out about the everyone, the village that it took to create a lot of these characters. Um, so I guess that's all it, we could say. It reminds me a little bit of, uh, like, who created the iPhone? Steve Jobs. Did he? No. You know, who, who, who created Apple computers? Steve Jobs. Well, what about Wozniak, right? That's kind of like the crux of uh, the whole Steve Jobs movie and the, yeah. his You're talking about biography. one of the world's greatest salesmen. You know, the dude, I mean, look, guy's got a salesman line where he's like, put a dent in the universe. That is such a fucking salesman line right there. And I'm not saying like he did nothing, but like it takes a village and that guy was just the front man um, and able to speak about it eloquently and uh, was there for every fucking interview and was there to drive with passion and, but ultimately a salesman. So um, take it's, uh, what you will. Vibe Woodchuck in chat says, I don't think Stan was stealing, but people definitely got robbed. Agreed. Well, a hundred percent, man. That's eloquently put. It took me 20 minutes to say that. <laughs> 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 Who said that? Uh, Woodchuck. What? Vibe Woodchuck. Well, Ivy Woodchuck? A vibe. Vibe Woodchuck? Vibe. Well done, Vibe Woodchuck. There's a future for you as a salesman someplace. <laughs> um, all right, that was story. That's not the sad story? That is not the sad story. <laughs> I don't know. That really brought the room down. Well, let's see how low we can go. Um, the great John Romita Sr. Oh, that is a sad story. Uh, the last of the great Silver Age creators uh, passed away uh, at the age of 93. Uh, announced by his son, John Romita Jr. Also an amazing artist. Also an amazing artist. I say this with a heavy art. My father passed away peacefully in his sleep, he wrote. He's a legend in the art world, and it would be my honor to follow in his footsteps. Please keep your thoughts and condolences here out of respect for my family. He was the greatest man I ever met. Mm. Um, John Romita Sr. co-created uh, characters including Wolverine, The Punisher, and Mary Jane Watson, among many, many That more. very famous image when you turn the page of Mary Jane Watson saying, face it, Tiger, you hit the jackpot. That's John Romita Sr. Yeah. Um, amongst many other things. Yeah, a, a legend. 93, man. 93. That's awesome. To go that far, they only you, know, you only wish they could just go on forever. Somebody who adds that much to the culture shouldn't have to die ever. But we all got to go. Ninety-three is a fucking fantastic run, Indeed. and what an absolute legend! A name that defines comic book greatness, and and again, his son, fucking also an equally great, powerful fucking comic book artist. J.R.J.R.? J.R.J.R., one of the greatest fucking Daredevil artists on the planet. Um, yeah, you're right, that is sad, man. But, like, what's not sad is everything that John Romita Sr. gave us while he was alive, particularly when he was drawing comic books. Created a lot of joy. Created a lot of characters that are still viable today, still working today, and will never die. Uh, you get a piece, you get to taste a little bit of immortality. 
uh, if you work in, in these businesses, man, like the business of show and all sorts of forms and whatnot. I think that's what drives a lot of us, man, is like to do something that outlasts us, knowing that one day we're going to leave this best of all possible worlds. And, you know, for a lot of people, of course, having children is the a legacy, is the way to be like, I was here. And then there are those of us who, that's not enough. We want to make something, leave it behind, and let people know we were here. John Ramita Sr. absolutely did that. What a legend. Uh, let's give it up for the great John Ramita Sr. Uh, all right, we're done with the news. Indeed. That's the news. Give it up for Mark. He gave me the fucking news. He did it. That only leaves one part left to the show, the auctioning of all these things that I signed. <laughs> this is quite the fucking deal. I was sitting here thinking about it, man. If you go to like a comic book show to see me, like I was just at Dallas Fan Expo. They charge like fucking 80 bucks for me to sign a thing. All you have to do is buy a ticket to this show and you can get anything you want fucking signed. We don't even do this at Smodcastle. You should. Believe me, I'm sitting here trying to figure out how to make money off this shit right now. I'm like, it's a lot of money sitting on that bar. Oh my God, speaking of a lot of fucking money, man, when we did a screening, the first screening on Thursday night of The Flash, uh, Keith, who lives in Jersey, um, he's a big comic book art collector, and I saw him at Dallas Fan Expo. Every time I see him at a, one of the cons, he has some glorious piece of fucking comic book artwork that like is, is rare and precious and shit. So he referenced being like a Jersey boy. I was like, you live in Jersey? He's like, yeah, I've told you that before. And I was like, well, come see The Flash on Thursday and bring your artwork. So he had, what he was showing me at Dallas Fan Expo was the first cover of the Flash that debuted Kid Flash's costume. Mm. Um, I, I'm sorry, I can't tell you who fucking drew it or whatnot. Uh, somebody smarter than I could. And I was standing next to the guy when he described it, but I didn't retain. Uh, but it's signed by Carmine Infantino. It's signed by Julie Schwartz, like a host of fucking DC legends signed. I think maybe it was a Carmine, a Carmine Infantino cover. Um, he had that. He had cu a couple covers for All-Star Comics that dated back to the 40s. And he had Todd McFarlane's Batman 423, I think it is, with the gigantic fucking cape. Like, classic piece of uh, Batman art that, like, you know, Todd McFarlane, of course, worked on Batman Year Two. But that cover is... It's iconic. It's just that the cape is its own fucking character on the cover. He's a woman in his arms and shit. He's got the dark, the white slits for eyes. Stunning fucking piece of artwork. So Keith got up on stage and he was showing off these pieces and telling like where he got them and how he came across them. And you know he's not one of these guys that does it for the money. He does it because like this was my childhood and these stories mean something to me and blah blah blah. But, you know, while we had a crowd there, I was like, yeah, that's all well and good, but how much does this shit go for? And he was so reticent to say, um, and I know why, because he had to get out to his car after the show. <laughs> and on that stage that night, we had no less than like four to six million dollars worth of comic book artwork. Uh. That McFarlane cover alone is a seven-figure piece of fucking artwork. And what was crazy was he bought it from Garib Seamus, who ran Wizard for years. And so Garib, there was a, on the back of the piece, he showed me the price that Garib paid for it. What he bought it for from either McFarlane or somebody who got, sold it to, got it from McFarlane and sold it to Garib Seamus. Now, Wizard was late 80s, early into the, you know, all throughout the 90s and into the aughts. Um, so take this with a grain of salt in terms of what was, what, what they, what, Garib must have paid for it back in the day. For this cover that is a seven-figure fucking cover right now, mo like, mo not just like one million dollars, couple million fucking dollar cover, man. $850 it was sold for. <laughs> Talk about a fucking markup, man. Like, that seems sinister, though. Because why sinister? Wizard was the price guy. So he bought it for eight fifty, and then next month printed... It's worth a million bucks. 
I don't think he ever had it as worth a million in any wizard, man. I think that's its current market value and stuff. But man, I, you know, sooner or later you let a piece go when you let it go, and who knows what he sold it to Keith for. Keith wasn't really forthcoming about what he bought it for and stuff. But I'm sure Garib made, you know, money on the deal, but could you imagine? Like, and Keith's not going to sell it. He, he has no interest in selling this stuff. He collects it. He doesn't get into the, you know, the kind of money aspect of it all. He thinks that's kind of gross. He's like, somebody got to save this, these pieces and keep it fun. He's like, there was a time when this was just fun. There was a time when nobody knew what this shit was worth and just preserving it was what it was all about. But he goes, it's become a very costly fucking hobby and shit. Uh, it was interesting, mm. though. I, can't I smell a heist. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fuck yeah, man. Some better writer than us should come up with a storyline <laughs> about that very thing. Huh. Um, all right, so is it time for Q&A? Yeah, we got, we got Q's. We got Q's and we got some A's, man. And we got gifts for those that uh, come up here and uh, have their... Their questions chosen. What do we got, Mark? Well, we got this uh, gift bag. It seems to be an Indiana Jones Dial of Destiny themed gift bag from uh, Brett Deacon and the good folks at 40X. Oh, our good friend Brett Deacon Ooh, this at 40X leather. Cinemas. If you've never seen a movie in 40X, the fuck is your problem? Uh, it's, it's like going on a ride to see a movie, man. It'll keep you awake and shit. So these Ooh. bags come with free 40X tickets. This motherfucker's leather. Look at this. A leather, or at least pleather, Indiana Jones. Leather-esque. Sleeveless vest. You know, like he wears in the movie. <laughs> uh, two 40X tickets, uh, a sleeveless Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny vest. What's in the box, Fox? It's a, a Moscow mule, like a copper cup. Is that right? Yeah. So it's a cup? Let's take it out and look at it. Whip it out. Each of the bags are different. Oh, they are. You're right. This one has a Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny hardcover book. Oh, yeah, it is a copper cup. And this looks like a journal. Um, and it also has a canvas bag uh, that says Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. So, yeah, you're going to get some shit, man. If your question gets picked and it's good enough, and let's be honest, it's always good enough. I don't think we've ever been like, your question sucked. Nope, sit down. Oh, but this is, di <laughs> this is a different, ca this ain't a canvas bag. This is like a gym bag and shit. So you're right, JC. Each bag, each gift, 40X gift bag comes with different gifts in it, plus two tickets. Two tickets. Two tickets per. So you get to go see, oh, and there's something different in this. The fuck is that? Open that up. Find out what that is. Are you shopping or? I am. I'm going to pick through this shit. Fuck all you people. I, need, I got me a new gym bag. It's a, like a journal slash passport holder. Let me see. I got a passport. <laughs> Could maybe have use for I need this a passport thing. that needs holding. Oh, it is a fucking passport holder. And, and you can put money in it, too. And it's, uh, it's made of snakeskin. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, that's nice. All right, so the good folks at 40X have come through again. Man, is, is Brett here? Is Deacon here? He was too busy with work to come. Always fucking working fucking for 40X, Brett. man. Well, give it a, he's not here, but raise one up for Brett Deacon, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> All right, here come our three questions. All right, question number one, Kevin Conroy. A Kevin Conroy, not the Kevin Conroy. That's the Kevin Conroy now. Give it up for Kevin Conroy. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> so my question is uh, Indiana Jones related. It is uh, what quest uh, or item of legend would you have Indiana Jones search for? Ooh. That's fucking good, man. Well, certainly not the Dial of Destiny. <laughs> I'd never heard about that until this movie. Um, I mean, Ark of the Covenant captured my imagination as a kid because I was Catholic and we had that. Like, they talked about it in the Bible and shit. And I was like, oh, that's real. <laughs> it is. 
I'm, I'm very gullible and naive. I'll buy any <laughs> comic. You know, I love comic books, but that's because I loved the Bible before that. And it's a series of fucking superhero stories. They just don't wear cool costumes. Um, let me see. The second one was uh, the Shankara Stones. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, in DC comics, like, they're always going after the Spear of Destiny. So Longinus? Yeah, it's the, it's the spear pierces that pierces Jesus. Christ mm-hmm. on the cross when the centurion is like, let's see if he's dead, and he pokes Jesus with the Spear of Destiny. And so the Spear of Destiny figured prominently in a lot of DC stories. Um, I, I would like to see him go after the Spear of Destiny. Well, look, I would like to see him retire. <laughs> This poor guy yeah. retired like fucking two movies ago, ro- rode off into the sunset, and they're like, nope, not done yet. Uh, but in a world where it was going to happen again, I would say the Spear of Destiny. Man, I thought it was always cool when they crossed him over with religious iconography. Uh, and, you know, and that just harkens back to the first one as well. So having him go after the Ark of the Covenant uh, and then having him go after uh, uh, Spear of Destiny, uh, that'd be pretty hot in my book. That's what I'd have him go after. Either that or the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> so he could run into Nick Cage, man. We get a twofer on that one and shit. What about you, Mark? Uh, I think I'm going to cross a little universes. It's still a religious artifact, but I would like to see him go after the Hammer of Thor. Oh, shit. Molnir. Molnir. And would he be worthy? Of oh, course yeah. he would. Oh, well, yeah. that's the question at the end of that movie is, is he worthy? Um, because it is a religious artifact, yeah. just not the sort of Judeo-Christian faith. Yeah. Um, it may or may not actually exist, but it's super fucking cool. Yeah. And if you can pick up that hammer, you become fucking Thor. Yeah. So Indiana Thor Jones. Oh, my God. Thrindiana Jones. Wait a second. So Disney owns Indiana Jones and yeah. Disney owns Thor. They yeah. can make that fucking movie. Totally do that shit. Get Harrison Ford on the phone. One more time. <laughs> One more time. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm sure he'd be like, how much? All right. <laughs> Polish my chaps, Callista. We're going back to work. <laughs> uh, that's tight. I would like to see that. Excellent job. Uh, great question. Give it up for Kevin Conroy. Do you want the cup? Yeah, take the, the fucking gym bag. Well done, man. Smart. Chat was all about Excalibur. Oh, shit, oh. man. I, we just ran that at Smodcastle. We showed Excalibur, and that's, that would have been a good one. Fuck yeah. Uh, uh, question. Yes, the charm of making. Uh, question number two, Joe Pasquale. Get up, Joe! Joe! What do you know, Joe? What do you got for us, Joe? Uh, hello? Hello. Hi. Hey, Kevin, before I, I say anything, today being Juneteenth, a special day, but it's also uh, my 13 year wedding anniversary of my lovely wife. Oh! Hey! Congratulations, say her name, because that'll get you laid tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Chloe. I love you. You're wonderful. Where'd you guys, oh. where'd you guys, everyone likes a good story. Where'd you guys meet? How'd you get together? Uh, uh, we had both just broken up, and I walked into a coffee house and I sat next to her and we talked for three hours. We talked about fucking the stupidest shit. We talked about Growing Pains and the show Growing Pains and how Kirk Cameron, for some reason, I can't fucking see that show anywhere. And uh, just random shit for three hours. Like it was effortless and I'd never had that with anybody else. And you just both come out of relationships? Yeah, we... Uh, so I bet you everyone in your lives were like, oh, it's just a rebound. Yeah, I was literally... <laughs> I, I had to get out of my place. I was just crying and sad and not eating and I had to just get the fuck out. And I went to this coffee house and I sat down and there she was. And 13 years later... Look at that. Oh. Give it up for him. 13 years. Well done. Today, Juneteenth, got married. That's the day. Outstanding. Uh, so my question is, in that horrible Flash movie... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you started so sweetly with your wife, and now you're like, here's my chance to shit on it. <laughs> uh, so uh, Flash's antics to change the past affect the castings of Back to the Future, Footloose, and Top Gun. 
if you could go back in time and change the casting of an iconic film in pop culture, what character would you recast and why? Oh, wow. What a great question. Ooh. Deep cuts. Um, all right, let me think. I would put Michael Keaton Batman in literally everything. <laughs> Even if it wasn't a fucking superhero movie and shit. Like, you know, fucking the greatest story ever told, he could be Jesus. Because you'd know that he'd get off that fucking cross. All right. I would, I would like to have seen the Ghostbusters that had Eddie Murphy as Winston Zettelman. Is that a thing? That was a thing. Like, that was a thing, and I think he bounced to do... I mean, he was, the, the original conversation was all fucking SNL guys, and so they wanted fucking Eddie to be that role. He then went and did Beverly Hills Cop and then couldn't go and do Ghostbusters. The role kind of ebbed and flowed and came and left the movie for a while, finally came back, and then Ernie Hudson got to play it. But the version of that with Eddie Murphy is Winston Zeddemore. Um, as, a, as, a, as a pop relic, I would kind of love to see that. Mm. As a pop relic, and because it's... Uh, uh, pertinent to our Indiana Jones gift bag, the Tom Selleck Raiders of the Lost Ark. Ah. Um, or the Dugray Scott X-Men with him as Wolverine. That was the guy originally cast as Wolverine and then something pulled him out of it. It wasn't an injury, right? It was Mission Impossible 2. Could you imagine losing Wolverine forever because of not Mission Impossible, Mission Impossible 2. Um, I would like to see uh, that as well. Uh, anybody else have any versions? Victor Garber. Victor Garber. As my best friend. Yes. <laughs> Cast him as my buddy. Who? Alec Baldwin as Batman. Was he ever close, Alec Baldwin as Batman? I mean, I, like, I, I always felt like of anybody in Beetlejuice, you would have fucking picked him because he kind of looked like a Bruce Wayne and shit, but no regrets, man, because Michael Keaton was the fucking choice. Um, anybody else have any? Who? Emily Blunt is Black Widow. Was that a thing? Huh? That's right. Yes! <laughs> Bill Murray in the Tom Mankiewicz ba uh, Batman script that he wrote. Tom Mankiewicz was a script doctor that wrote most of what we know Dick Donner's Superman uh, movie to be. Like Mario Puzo wrote the first draft, mm -hmm. Tom Mankiewicz did most of the fucking work and created that, the movie that Dick Donner then went forward on. He did an interview in Starlog years ago with, with Return of the Jedi on the cover and he talked about a Batman movie that he had written that they were working on and he was the first person I'd ever seen talk about a Dark Knight version of Batman. Taking the character back to his more grim origins, taking it away from camp, and there was an illustration in the star log, a cartoon uh, of ba uh, Batman wearing a fucking, what looks like the current day Batman suit. And this article of star log came out in 83, six years before Batman would ever hit the screens. And he was wearing like a fucking more uh, mean version of the bat suit and shit. And he was slamming a door on the Adam West and Burt Ward versions of Batman and Robin and he was going, pay no attention to those two, or something like that. So he talked about in that article, Bill Murray as, as Batman, Peter O'Toole as... Alfred? The Joker. It's like the sad clown version of the character. Oh. Uh, and then somebody fairly recently said that there was, and I don't know, it, it's not me leaning into what you just said, but. Bill Murray was, was intended to be Batman, and in what iteration, Eddie Murphy was going to be Robin. But it was a serious take on the subject, or at least more serious than the campy version and stuff. Hmm. So excellent fucking call. I would, I would, that'd be kind of hot to see Bill Murray Batman. Excellent question. Yes, well done. Give it up for Joe. The cup or the bat, the cup one? I mean, Chloe might like that vest. Yeah, it comes with a vest. Tonight, yes. <laughs> yes. Dude, happy anniversary. Take it over there. <laughs> Joe is going to wear that vest to bed tonight and nothing else. As he 
fucking dives in for that dial of destiny. <laughs> wasn't there a Bill Murray, or wasn't John Belushi supposed to play Ghostbusters Bill in Ghostbusters yeah, he instead was of Bill be Murray? The Bill Murray part I think that'd be interesting. Excellent. Not point. better, but interesting. Yeah, yeah. Also, the other one that nobody wants to see was Stuart Townsend as Aragorn in the Lord of the That's Rings right. movies. He was a. Uh, uh, the lead in the Lord of the Rings, the lead non Hobbit was going to be Stuart Townsend, who was cast. Who played the lead non Hobbit? Uh, Vigo Mortensen. Oh, that was it. Vigo. And who yeah. is Stuart Townsend? He was. <laughs> he was in League of Extraordinary League. Gentlemen. I think was he, he was. He was in League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. I think he. Dorian Gray, right. I'm not. A, I don't go big on the Lord of the Rings, so I'm. I, that, but good to know. There's one. <laughs> Thanks. Cheers. Uh, and then last. What happened? Was he cast? And he, then... was ca he was. He was Eric Stoltz. He was cast. They he was shot there, with him, and then and they started probably pre-production costume tests, and they were like, "Oh, this ain't. This isn't it." Wow. And I think Vigo was put on a plane and flown to New Zealand, and was acting the next day. Holy shit! I think is the the legend. Too bad it didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> he was in all those movies, right? Yeah. Uh, last question. Aaron Anderson from Canada. Aaron, get on up here. Everyone give it up for Aaron. She's going to take us home. Hello. What part of Canada? I'm from Kitchener, Ontario. Kitchener! I've yes, fucking been I, there. Yes, you have. I did. I saw the kids in the hall there fucking back in 1995. So I'm doing a live I've show. I've come and seen you in Toronto multiple times as well. So Thank yeah. you. Very excited. It's my first time meeting seeing Mark. Hi! Hi. <laughs> it's very exciting. Thanks for coming. And Bamp Man. I can't. Oh my God, he's got his own fucking Canadian <laughs> following and shit. <laughs> oh, we love Bamp Man, eh? Um... I regret my question so much right now. You regret it? <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, so my question, we're talking The Flash, we're talking Batman iterations. Yeah. A traditional question would be, marry, fuck, kill. <laughs> <laughs> I'm regretting the options That doesn't feel like a very Canadian question, <laughs> I man. I know, I know. Who are we going to marry? Who are we going to fuck? Are you Who ready? Are we kill? <laughs> Who are our three choices? All right, so... I, I feel like I know who's going to be a top for you, which is Michael Keaton. Yeah. We're <laughs> well, but I mean, which one is that? Well, that that's Definitely just, that, not that's kill, but is it marry or fuck? That's just for your, yeah, that's just for your consideration. All right. Okay. Our second is, you know, an actor that could play the shark in Jaws, Ben Affleck. Ben Affleck, yes. yes I love him. And then my third was George Clooney, but I want to add an extra option to this question. So Kay. marry, fuck, kill and Jeff's Kiss, and we're going to add Christian Bale into the mix. Oh. So we have <laughs> Mary Fuck Kill, Jeff's Kiss, Michael Keaton, Ben Affleck, George Clooney, and Christian Bale. This is a real fucking Sophie's no. Choice right here, man. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I like all those guys for one thing or another. All right, so <laughs> Mary, I go Ben Affleck. Yeah, he's one of my favorite people on the planet. And I, don't get me wrong, I think he's very sexy. There's a fucking shot that Jennifer put up for Father's Holy Day. shit, man. Did you see that picture? What the fuck? That dude's like 50 years old. He looks, it, like, he looks incredible. Being married to her has put him in somehow in better fucking shape. He well, looks, I, mean, I, get I, it. I saw that picture. It was a fucking thirst trap, and I was caught. <laughs> he looks so fucking good. So I, I, he's 100% sexy and shit like that. But I mean, I, sex burns a lot of calories. That's true, I guess. And he also looked tired. <laughs> it's just like, he's fucking abs. Uh, snap. <laughs> um, I would, uh, as much as, as sexy as I, I, uh, he is, um, I would, I want to, I'd want to grow old with him. You know what I'm saying? He's a funny fucking dude, man. And like, he, you know, he can make me laugh and he's also smart and very charming and, and just a good guy. He's got a real good heart and stuff. And, um, I, you know, I, uh, of course I always, when you think of people, you think about your, the era that you spent the most time with them. And like, I spent the most time with them, like from, I would say mall rats up through, you know, uh, Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back. 
And over those years, I got to see him go from like the dude who slept on my couch to like the dude who sold me his house at a very reasonable price. And, uh, <laughs> and I got to live in it for the last like 22 years. So when I think of Ben, I think about that version of Ben. And uh, he's never changed. Whenever I, I saw him at the air premiere, he was at the Flash premiere, but I didn't see him until they did the intros in the beginning. Andy Machete was like, Ben Affleck. I was like, he's fucking here? I was like Dustin Hoffman and The Graduate. I was like, Elaine! <laughs> um, so I would marry that motherfucker, man, because I would grow old with him, man. Uh, fuck. I guess that leaves Michael Keaton. <laughs> but you know what? Yeah, that stands to reason. Because I so fuck with that bat version of fucking Batman. And, and, and I wouldn't want to grow old with Michael Keaton. Here's my Michael Keaton story. So, Michael Keaton goes to the Dogma premiere. And I'm a huge fucking, you know, fan of Batman, as well as the rest of his work and shit. So he's, uh, we have the premiere at the Harmony Gold screening room here in Los Angeles. And uh, he's there, and I see him going in on the red carpet and shit. And it's about halfway through the movie, you know, I've seen Dogma a zillion times at that point. I was a huge cigarette smoker in those days. And us 90s kids were like fucking unrepentant, ardent cigarette smokers. Like, I would go to events that didn't allow smoking just so I could light up and be like, I'm a smoker. I was that asshole and shit. So I leave my premiere in the middle to go outside and have a fucking cigarette. And who is outside on his cell phone but Michael Keaton? having like a, a full volume conversation with an agent about his, his fucking job or whatever. So he's left my movie to go have a conversation outside. So I'm sitting there having a cigarette and just watching him fucking talk and he pays no attention to me this whole time he's talking. And then finally he looks up and sees me and I'm the guy who got up to introduce the movie. So even if he didn't know who I was, at that point he would know who I was. And so Michael Keaton's on the phone, he's like, no, I don't wanna do that. And he sees me and he goes, yeah, but, Great movie, man. Yeah, but fucking. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I would fuck Michael Keaton, Batman. Um, let's Jeff's kiss it first. Fuck. See, I got nothing against the other guy, but like Clooney just seems like an all right fucking dude, man. Like Clooney. Clooney, I, my one inter interaction with Clooney goes back to when he made, what was that? There he is. In case you don't know what George Clooney looks like. For a second, I was like, he's here? Like, yeah. I saw the door open? I was like, what the fuck? Well, he does have that booze, right? So he does. It makes sense. Giuseppe, how are you? Come on in. What, is the, uh, what was the movie he directed about uh, Chuck Barris? The uh, yeah, Confessions, Confessions of a, a Dangerous, dangerous Mind. mind. So, that, was that the first thing he directed? Yeah. Yeah. That was the first thing he directed. So I'm at the, God, this is so name dropping and so Hollywood, but this is how it happened. I was at the Chateau Marmont for Fuck some yeah, fucking you event, were. and I was waiting for my car, for the valet to bring around my car, and we had a website called Movie Poop Shoot that was based on the Movie Poop Shoot from Jay and Silent Bob uh, Strike Back. But, you know, we, it became a legitimate fucking website that had people working for it that reviewed movies and shit like that. And I guess whoever reviewed uh, Confessions of a Dangerous Mind didn't give it a very good review. So I didn't review it. Somebody working for that website did, and I guess all George Clooney got out of all of that was Kevin Smith's website, shit on your movie. So George Clooney comes over and he goes, I hear you didn't like my movie. And I was like, what? God, no. I said, I fucking, Confessions? I thought, I thought it was amazing. He's going, your website didn't. I was like, oh, I don't run the website. That's just, I just own it and stuff. And he goes, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I was like, oh my God, this is, this is, hor this is horrifying for me. There, there's the real George Clooney. <laughs> so then George Clooney, I, I don't know if he saw the terror in my face or whatever, but he went to make me more comfortable and shit. He goes, that's all right. He's going like, let me tell you a thing that me and my friends just did. And he told me a fucking story that I was like so charmed by. So I guess Kenny Turan, who used to review movies for the LA Times, mm -hmm. I don't know if he still does. He doesn't. He doesn't. So he used to back then. And I guess. I killed Kenneth Turan. <laughs> 
No. He, when I was uh, at the Times, he was retired. He was already gone. He, Kenny Turan wrote the review of Mallrats, which I still quote to this day. Um, he had loved Clerks, and he did not like Mallrats at all. A lot of people did not. A lot of the critics hated Mallrats. And his review opened. The Mallrats review in the LA Times said, if Sundance or the AFI ever wants to offer a course on what not to do as a second feature, Mallrats should be at the heart of the curriculum. <laughs> That is fucking Fuck. verbatim. If you look it up online right now, word for word, I'll never forget that shit, man. I don't remember my wedding vows, and I remember the fucking <laughs> opening words of fucking Kenny Turan's review. So I was delighted by this story when George Clooney shared it. He goes, well, Kenny Turan didn't like Confessions of a Dangerous Mind either. He's going, so me and my friends, we went to his house and we egged it that night. <laughs> and I was like, the fuck? And he goes, that's not even the best part of the story. He's going... Then I did an interview where nobody asked me the question, but I said, the hell, I did, I did not egg Kenny Turan's house. <laughs> and, he, and I said, why did you do that? He goes, because then Kenny Turan would knew that I fucking egged his house. <laughs> is that is, Kenny Turan? That's Kenneth Turan. <laughs> is that Andrew? Give it up for Andrew, man. That was a oh. quick fucking find. Well done. Andrew, the unsung hero of Fat Man Beyond, always hiding in the back but making magic and shit. Uh, okay, so he gets the Jeff's kiss because what a great sense of humor. And then by process of elimination, that leaves Christian Bale to, I mean, I wouldn't say kill, but that is the question. Yeah, you kind of have to say kill. Like, back off, Canada. Fucking... But yes, I guess ultimately then I would kill him. But not because I'm like, fuck Christian Bale, just because those other three guys are pretty damn awesome. I mean, uh, could we, before I go, Aaron, yes. we're yes. friends now. <laughs> um, can Why we, didn't I think of that approach? <laughs> 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 could, we, could we broaden the sample selection? Like, could we add more Batmans? Yes, absolutely. That was See? Like Look what happened. Bell. Oh, yes. shit. There was, I didn't want to, yeah, All right. pigeonhole anybody here. Yeah. Excellent. That so, means you get Adam West, you get Kevin Conroy. I know. Val Kilmer. Uh, the I'm, other Kevin Conroy, not this Kevin Conroy. I'm going to marry George Clooney. Because he's rich. Because he's rich, Piat! <laughs> smart. Good play. I hadn't thought of that I mean, shit. He's got I that, was marrying for love. You're marrying for money. <laughs> so much smarter. He's got that fucking house in Lake Como. He's got the fucking tequila brand. Like, yeah. we're set. Yeah. Um... I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fuck, I'm a fuck Val Kilmer. Because that's a beautiful motherfucking man. Absolutely. Look at those fucking lips. That's, it's all lip. All lip. What can you do with that much lip? Whatever I want him to do with that yeah. much lip. Excellent call. He's going to be a sloppy Gotham party bottom. <laughs> Plus he's probably a real genius in bed. Yeah. Thank you, 80s kids. And he knows how to keep a top secret. Oh, shit! What? Oh, still going! <laughs> All right. So I'm, I'm, I'm fucking Val. I'm marrying... Uh, Clooney. Clooney. I'm Jeff's kissing Kevin Conroy. Yes. Give it up for the, the late, Kevin great Conroy. Kevin Conroy. Deserves every Jeff's kiss in the world. Um, and I'm, I'm going to kill uh, Robert Pattinson. Oh, shit! You didn't even, he wasn't even an option and you brought him out. <laughs> See, Bell likes it. <laughs> Bell knows. Um, why? Because he's sparkly vampire? <laughs> Sparkle vamp? Um, Sparkle vamp. Just because he's so fucking morose all the time anyway. Like, I don't know. I don't know. It, it, uh, I'm not going to say anything, just he's a dude who doesn't look like he's in love with life, so I'm going to just help. Fucking A, man. <laughs> Genius answer. You deserve the fucking bag. Well done. <laughs> but Aaron asked the question, Aaron gets the bag. Give it up for Aaron. Thank you. Wow, man. That's a fucking good round of Q&A and shit. Hell yes. So that brings our show to a close. Kids, did you have a good time this evening? <laughs> I cannot thank you all enough uh, for coming out. Remember, man, if you uh, loved the, the Flash, keep on loving it. If you didn't like the Flash, come keep, sit by me. Yeah. 
Um, give it up for uh, the guy who, uh, who this here bar it belongs to and stuff. We don't get to do the show live in front of people were it not for him, were it not for Scum and Villainy Cantina, located on Hollywood Boulevard in Hollywood, California. If you've never been here, make it a point to get here. Uh, and then ask for Banff man himself, JC. Give it up for JC. <laughs> Uh, don't forget, kids, if you want to maybe, if you want to see a movie for free at Smog Castle that some people are deeply invested in seeing, go to SmogCastleCinemas.com right now, get yourself some tickets for the Bears Driving Clerks Cartoon Marathon or mm -hmm. the Fat Man Beyond live show August 25th out there in fucking New Jersey. Uh, you know who's going to be standing next to me or sitting next to me at that show? Because oddly enough, at Smog Castle we sit. Yeah, here this we is stand, a long man. time. You can get my steps in at this motherfucker. <laughs> uh, I've been on the picket line in a while, so I feel good being up yeah, here. Yeah, how goes the strike? I'm still not working, so it's going great. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, give it up for the dude who'll be sta sitting next to me in Jersey on August 25th. Tickets at smogcastlecinemas.com. Or the dude who's generally always standing next to me right here at the Scum and Villainy Cantina. Uh, the level-headed, pragmatic, fucking honest one of the two of us kids. <laughs> Give it up for the great Mark Bernardo. <laughs> and that is Fat Man Beyond for this week. I'm Kevin Smith. I'm Mark Bernardo. Tune in next time. Same fat time, same fat channel. Smogcast.com or YouTube.com slash Kevin Smith. Jeff's Kiss! This is the cat. Greetings, everybody, and welcome to the AKA Ask Kev Anything. Every saga has a 10 year anniversary, ladies and gentlemen, and this is what happens when Jay and Silent Bob get old. I'm Kevin Smith. Cheers, everyone!